Madam and Mr. Chair, do you want to formally start us and then I'll dive us into the agenda and the plan for today? Sure. Welcome, everybody. I, I think uh, we have, um, by last count, 10 out of 17 of us right now. A few more may trickle in, but we need to get started. We need to get working. Um, today's going to be kind of an important day. Uh, Barrick's going to present a, a PowerPoint that's the result of kind of a distillation of as much of the information presented in front of us, discussed amongst us. And, uh, you know, Maureen and I had uh, efforts with uh, Carrie and Barrick to, to, okay, what's what's the kind of super majority agreement spots where there's still some areas for more discussion and can we just kind of advance the ball today and get more toward a, uh, seeing the end of the runway? Uh, Maureen? Yeah, and, and obviously what we've put some ideas out and so, you know, because uh, we thought it would be best to put ideas out about um, looking at participants, membership, um, how operate some operational things. So we're going to get into the details of that. But first of all, uh, Vincent sent an email and wanted to um, address issues around open meetings. So I'm going to turn it over to Vincent and um, so you can uh, throw that question out. Hi, thanks, Maureen. Uh, yeah, no, it's not much to the question, just that I've heard various remarks and have myself not entirely clear, nor do I recall whether we had a conversation about open meeting requirements and just thought it would be helpful to have a moment of um, getting everybody on the same page about that. Is there anything particular you're concerned about? Is it offline discussion or just making sure that we make everything available on the website or um, or access to our work, um, anything, or, or it's just a general question? I think it's mostly just a general question to establish that we're all on the same page and um, whether offline discussion is within our scope or not, or. Tom and Maureen, I don't know if you want to add color. If we go back to the beginning of, of the working group and, and the directions, uh, we are a, a public body and subject to those open meetings requirements, which does mean uh, that, one, we notice these meetings so that they are publicly available. People can access uh, either the recording or in person. Uh, and anything that has to do with the official business of this working group needs to take place at a noticed meeting. And just to break that down as simply as possible, and then I'll hand it back to, to Tom and Maureen, uh, we can't have members meeting outside of our scheduled meetings where your conversations relate to the official business of this working group. Uh, there was a recognition initially that certainly people have overlapping lives, so merely two members present somewhere uh, doesn't constitute a meeting uh, of the, or the business of this working group. But if two members were to meet and engage in discussions about the matters before this group and, and the official business, that would cross into uh, a requirement that it be noticed. Tom and Maureen, do you want to provide any additional guidance on that? Yeah, my only thought is obviously Tom and I talk, okay? And and what we have tried to do, um, and, and we don't notice it as a public meeting, is to meet with Carrie and Barrick and, and, and hone down for presentation to you a structure that we can consider we don't make any policy decisions, but we try to put out there what we think we heard from the group. Those are the only discussions. We're not saying this is what we're gonna push forward or whatever, this is what we're gonna put out there. Um, I think those kinds of things or structural things are when meetings are, what the issues are out there that are gonna be discussed are are okay, but uh, like a meeting to discuss the substance of the group and the decision making is not appropriate under uh, open meetings. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Mr. Acheny, does that address at least substantively what you wanted to address with the full group to align? Well, it certainly does address the question as to whether we're under open meeting requirements. So thank you for that. Okay. 
Uh, and just to update everybody, we do now have five members in person, six members online. We have 11 of our 17, certainly constituting uh, above a, a simple majority of our membership. Um, so with that, I'm going to move us forward. I will be spending a fair amount of time sharing slides, uh, and, and that means that I may not see you if you just physically raise your hand online. I'll ask you to use the emoticon because I will have limited screen uh, showing. Uh, but I want to, as Tom and Maureen said up top, they've spent some time with our support from the notes and really tried to distill down from our last few conversations around things like structure, mission, the additional idea of a vision, uh, duties, membership, where we have some opportunity uh, to identify consensus on those. Uh, today's meeting is really going to be split into two sessions. Uh, the first where we think, because we've talked about it at multiple meetings, we should hopefully be close to uh, consensus on it. Uh, things like mission, vision, hopefully structure. Uh, we know we're gonna need some meteor conversations on things like the membership, where this is housed and, and some of those details. Uh, so what we're trying to do is really identify into these two bigger buckets, those where we think we are ready to reach consensus uh, on one of the recommendations based on conversations to date, or where we are very close to being able to do so. If, for example, somebody says, I like that, but I'd like to see just a couple of words changed and then we will be there, um, or where we need to uh, include the two different opinions or perspectives in the report. If you'll remember going back a few meetings, we have said that there are going to be cases most likely where we don't have unanimous agreement and we may be including a majority opinion and the opinion of others who want to share what ideas, concerns, or considerations they would like to have addressed. Uh, and we hopefully today will identify what remains of our issues where we've got some uh, additional work to do. Uh, as Carrie flagged in the email out with the agenda, it is uh, almost certain that we are going to require an additional meeting. We will work with all of you to determine the date, time, and format, whether that's hybrid, in-person, or all virtual. Uh, but that's our intent today, is to get through as many issues as we can, finding uh, consensus, and that may not mean unanimous consensus, and then teasing out where we've got some more work to do on some of the others. Um, as we do this, um, as I said, up top, we're hoping to have abbreviated discussions on some of the topics that we've already worked through, uh, and then we'll have extended discussions on things like membership and where to house this. Um, as we talk about moving towards consensus, um, my ask is going to be that we will start each one with just doing a little bit of a temperature check, uh, an informal straw poll, if you will, of where do we stand going into the conversation to see if we're close. Uh, that's not a binding vote of any kind. Uh, and then we're going to do a, a full group roll call vote. And I'm gonna ask everybody to weigh in with one of three options. Either yes, I can support or live with it uh, if this has the majority support. Two, I could support this, but my support would be contingent on some minor revisions. We will not be using today to make those minor revisions. We will air those, we will capture those, and that is something that we will revise and bring back to our next conversation. Or the third option, I oppose or I do not support this. Um, again, as I mentioned, for votes against a recommendation that has received majority support from the membership, we will invite members to provide language if you'd like it considered to be included in the report. So that is the intention of today. Before I start going into the topics, does anybody have any questions uh, about our approach to today's conversation? I am seeing none in person or online. So I'm going to move us to our first, which is the mission. And this has been, uh, I, I will flag that you'll see in your deck both a mission and uh, a vision. Uh, and Rep Soper, I apologize. Let me get you copies of all of this. And Barrick, can we drop it in the chat to the PowerPoint? It has been emailed to all of the members. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. All, right. all of the members, you should have received that deck from Carrie via email. Uh, if not, shoot her a, a message in the chat and she'll get that to you. Uh, we'll be reviewing both a mission and a vision. The mission comes from our, our multiple conversations on this, and I will read it, and then we will do a quick temperature check vote. Uh, through an inclusive and collaborative process that engages diverse groups of stakeholders impacted by the criminal or juvenile justice system, the Commission to Improve Justice Systems in Colorado shall research, consider, and provide data-informed, evidence-based criminal and juvenile justice policy recommendations to Colorado's elected officials 
that seek to reduce crime and recidivism and support victims while promoting the improved safety, health, and well-being of all Colorado communities. Be more and, and that was a name that Tom made up. So it does, so it just it, stayed it in that, there. It was that so, or a unicorn. With that or unicorn. <laughs> Okay, so that doesn't have to be. It was just a name. It should. Uh, other places were saying XXX because we didn't pick a name, but that was a name Tom made up. So it really is doesn't have to be like voted on as the name of the group. Okay, so we will view CIJSC as a placeholder only at this point. Before I ask for any formal votes, uh, I'm going to ask by a show of hands. And for those of you online, I'm going to ask that you use the raise your hand icon. How many members in general are supportive of this mission you see in front of you? Folks online, if I could get you to either physically raise your hand or, or use the, the raise your hand icon. And let me just add in here, um, this is basically the mission we talked about the last time, but people wanted us to put in reduce crime and recidivism from one of the other proposals. And we and so we put in that and changed some of the language from the notes from the last meeting. And then Ubaldo uh, did another proposed recommendation that if you look on the next page, we did as a vision statement because we talked about creating that as a vision. So. Just if you're flipping through, that's what's next. So at this point, I have five hands affirmative in the room, one online. Do other, uh, now I've got a few more online. It looks like we've got three, four online. Uh, we now have nine. I'm gonna go ahead and move us to a formal roll call vote on this. And again, I'm gonna give three options. I will first ask who is prepared to support this as is. I will then ask who would be able to support with narrow and limited edits that you will propose. And then the third option will be who cannot support or opposes this. And I will be doing the, the roll call vote. I'm tracking it here. Uh, Mr. Atchity. Uh, so support with suggested edits. Support with revisions, thank you. Ms. Kane. Uh, support. Mr. Chavez. Support with revisions. Thank you, Ms. Drake. Support. Tristan Gorman. Support with revisions. Thank you. Uh, I don't believe Director Hilke or a proxy are on. Uh, Mr. Lester. Support with revisions. Mr. Soper. Support. Mr. Raines. Support. Ms. Sanchez. Support. Ms. Terranova. Support. And Emily, you're probably going to have to help me talk to Nestaval. Close. Talk to Nostavel. Uh, support. Thank you. Sure. Representative Weissman. I'm happy to support for now. Also very willing to see any suggestions that um, other members are mentioning. Thank you. We have seven outright supports with Mr. Weissman willing to support or with revisions. We have four requests for revisions. I'm going to ask that each member that requests revisions I'm going to do a lightning round now, and then I'm going to ask that you email them to Carrie and me. We will consolidate those, and we'll bring this back for a final vote. Uh, Mr. Atchity, would you like to address the revisions you'd like to see? Sure, thank you. Uh, just a little bit more upstream. So where it says uh, that seek to reduce crime and recidivism, I would say seek to reduce incarceration, comma, crime and recidivism. Understood. Going upstream and including incarceration ahead of reduced crime and recidivism. Thank you, Mr. Atchity. Mr. Chavez. I second uh, Mr. Atchity with the uh, inclusion of the incarceration work. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. 
Tristan. I will be the third ask for the inclusion of the incarceration work. Thank you, Mr. Lester. I'd ask that um, in addition to uh, reduced crime that we put somewhere in there where it says uh, address disparities and disproportionalities. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, should we take a, a vote with those edits since they're relatively minor? I think we can certainly add incarceration. incarceration. Um, I would ask um, Jason to kind of, where are we looking to, how do you want to word that and where, how would you address that? Uh, what I'd like is just for it to be uh, noticed um, with regard to like the overrepresentation of black and brown people that are in the criminal justice system. And that is something that is continuing to be an effort that uh, this group would work to address. Um, that, that That's where I was going with that. Mr. Lester, just for clarity, your ask would be that we include additional language that part of the mission is to reduce disparities in the criminal justice system? Reduce disparities and disproportionality. Thank you. So I'm um, seeing that where we would say Colorado's elected officials that seek to on line one, two, three, four, five, reduce disparities and disproportionality, reduce crime and recidivism and support victims so that there would be three there. I believe we would also be including reduced yeah. incarceration. Reduce incarceration and recidivism, crime and recidivism. I would move we include those and, and call it a day on the on the mission statement. We've got a, a motion from uh, the chair to include those. Do I have a second? Mr. Weissman seconds. With the revisions that we include reduce incarceration and we reduce disparities and I'm disproportionality. disproportionality. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm going to move this to a an additional vote uh, rather than a roll call since we've gone through that. I'm going to ask if anybody opposes adopting this mission with those two changes. Do I have any opposed to adopting it as a revised? I just have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so like we noted, the mission statement has a proposed name and the vision has some placeholder blanks. I think maybe we're about there on the mission in case that folks wanna workshop the name. Can we maybe park that and then plug it back into the mission as nope. mission once we learn? Yeah, Why don't we yeah, leave that as a that. blank? placeholder for, for what we are adopting and recommending? Yes. So with no name to be included, with the additions that we have discussed, does anybody oppose moving this forward? I see none. The mission as discussed and revised moves forward. Next, I'm going to move us to vision and we will go through a similar process here. It is the vision of blank. Yeah. to lead Colorado in the creation of a comprehensive and transformative approach to criminal and juvenile justice, committed to collaboration, persistence, and unwavering dedication to equity and justice. The X centers the voices of all persons with lived experiences with the justice system, supported by informed and engaged system professionals. Through inclusive policies, community engagement, and evidence-based practices, the entities strive to build justice systems that not only address systemic barriers, but also uplifts and supports every individual on their journey toward healing, rehabilitation, and community reintegration. I will first go to a general temperature check by a show of hands and members online, I'm gonna switch it up and ask you to physically raise your hands with me. Can I see how many members online and in person generally support the vision that has been presented. And I have a show of hands of any who generally oppose. Before we go into a roll call vote, would anybody like to make comments on this? Well, I, I was waiting for the third option there. I thought we were doing the three options. Oh no, we're, that's, we'll do that on the actual votes. Okay. I was just doing a temperature check. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, as far as the temperature check, I think the vision completely leaves out 
kind of the public safety component in terms of, and I, not to, not to use my definition of public safety, but, um, you know, in the mission, when we talk about reduce crime and recidivism and support victims, um, I don't see the, the reduce crime in here. I just feel like it's lacking part of it. I agree with that, Tom. I feel like it's um, heavily weighted in terms of a viewpoint towards justice involved people who are in the system as defendants and lacks a voice for victims. I'm also starting to struggle with I'm starting to struggle with what is, is, from my perspective, starting to sound like a weaponization of the word transform. I, I want to know what everybody means by that, because if it's upend and reboot, I'm not there in the use of the word. If it's enhance and improve, if that's how we're, but I think it matters because I've, I've started hearing this banter um, and questions asked of me, what does that mean? And so I, I'm already hearing substantive enough questions here that I don't think we'll be going to a formal vote. We'll probably be using our time right now to workshop this a bit and, and bring some revisions back. But I, I'd like to continue to invite comments on what is here uh, and any responses to Ms. Drake or Mr. Rain's questions or concerns. Mr. Weissman. Um, thank you. I guess two points. Um, what does transform mean? I think there's a different answer for every member of this group. Um, I'd have to think about exactly how I'd want to articulate my answer to the points about matching the vision statement to the mission statement as to um, reducing incarceration, reducing crime, um, public safety, supporting survivors of crimes, the sorts of things that were just mentioned. Just a syntactical point, I think the logical place to put that is basically in the last clause. Um, starting at about halfway of the fourth line from the bottom on this version, comma XX strives to a bunch of things. It's in that list of, so we've, we've had some very sort of broad language about the vision, and then we start to focus it down. Okay, from that vision, you know, here are the action sort of outputs. Uh, however, we choose to frame any concerns that um, maybe want to be included here just from a drafting standpoint, that's where I do it. I don't have specific language at this point. Thank you, Mr. Weissman. Uh, and we have several comments uh, here. Uh, Andre Stancil says, uh, I agree with Tom. Director Hilke says, I, I do agree with Tom and Janet's comments regarding a public safety component. Uh, let me bring in Emily and then Vincent online. Thanks. I, you know, I could see some revisions being made to this, but I also think it can be read that you know, that justice involved individuals could include crime victims. I do think it's important to call out victims, but we're not necessarily calling out anyone else who's justice involved. So I, I think for that reason, I supported it, but I do think having something towards the public safety comment that Tom made would be important as well. Um, and generally victims get forgotten about in these processes. So if we're gonna call out public safety, we probably should actually put victims into the statement as well would be my position. Thank you, Emily. And as I go to Vincent, we've got another comment in the chat that regarding transformative, I don't mind the term as long as it doesn't exclude truly evidence-based what works in the criminal justice system type of ideas. Uh, Mr. Atchity. Thank you. And uh, I've taken Director Hilke's support of the evidence-based approaches and was just gonna propose language hearing um, Tom Rain's suggestion and say that uh, strives to build justice systems that promote safe, the safety and well-being of communities, not only by addressing systemic barriers, et cetera, et cetera, so that you've got your safety and well-being as, your, as the focus of these systems. Thank you, Vincent. Director Hilke. Yeah, thanks. I thought I'd just elaborate more on my comment there that I wrote in the in the comment section. Um, you know, I too worry that when we, I don't mind the word transformative as long as it doesn't preclude uh, 
ideas that we know work, right? Or if it's just transformative of thinking of something new that's innovative, that is not research or evidence-based, then I think it becomes uh, a problematic, you know, for instance, I think no one's going to dispute that cognitive based behavioral programs and programming and, and that kind of thing is, is things that is very useful. And the expansion of that um, and, you know, to different places is a good idea in, in, you know, nearly every case, but it's not a new idea and it probably wouldn't necessarily be transformative. So uh, as long as it doesn't, you know, exclude other things that we know what works or has proven to work in meta research, then I, then I'm okay with it. Thank you, Director Hilke. Chair Reigns. Yeah, I I appreciate all of that comment. Um, and and <clears throat> at least nibbling around the edges of public safety. <clears throat> I, I like everything that's in here, <clears throat> but there's a reality. <clears throat> Recommendations are all going to be addressed toward criminal laws. And so the crime aspect has to be present. For, for me to be comfortable. I think we're getting there. Um, so I appreciate all the input. Yeah, and uh, I just have one comment. I agree with Emily, but as I read this, when I read centers the voices of all persons with lived experiences, that meant everybody. That was an inclusive term of not only victims, but defendants and um, healing, you know, in rehabil you know, rehabilitation, obviously, I wa actually wasn't my favorite word here because I remember one juvenile who went in 15 said, I can't be rehabilitated because I was never well to begin with, you know? And so it was from me, well, Mesa County. And so um, I think that's really true. So it wasn't my favorite word, but he healing was supposed to be for everybody and community was supposed to be. So, um, um, I generally support it. I do think some tweaks are going to be, I think the public safety ones are, um, I'm not sure we call out, you know, where you are because as, and I'm just going to jump forward a little bit as Tom and I talked about this being mission, it carried over into what we heard about who you want to be members because it's what we're looking at in terms of members is centering these voices rather than the voices of systems people. And so, and that's why it tweaks Ubaldo's language a little bit in saying um, centering the voices of all persons supported by informed and engaged professionals, because they sent, we center the voice there, but there are people outside that have to support that voice or else, you know, they, sadly you need some lawyers, you know, mm -hmm. in the room, so. That's my thought. <laughs> so, Representative Soper, did I see your hand up? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here. Um, overall, I agree with you, Maureen and Tom. Uh, you know, as I first had read the line that said, voice of all persons with lived experience with the justice system, of course, I immediately thought, oh, those would be people who'd been found guilty and perhaps had spent um, time in DOC. Uh, but then, you know, as you think about it more, you realize that it's also inclusive of victims. And perhaps how we kind of call that out is perhaps after the calm after justice system, say, including uh, victims of crime and those um, who have served time in DOC or something like that, because I do think that, that that is relevant and it shows what we're meaning here, but it also means that there would be additional people there with lived experience because those who actually have to do policing are also an important element of any reforms that occur in the future here in Colorado. Mom and Maureen, do you feel like you've got a, a sense of some of these key areas uh, around public safety, around identifying the, who we mean by experience with? Yeah, I think I think we can work through this with the input that we just got. And we've just got w another comment uh, from Mr. Chavez. I like the terms improve and enhance. I'd also like to see something like survivors or survivors of crime. I'm going to suggest, though, that, that the edits to this one are more substantive than I'm care, comf comfortable asking for a vote without people seeing. So I think what we will do is work to revise this one, and this will be a roll call vote when we come back for our next meeting. Yeah, and and I would like from Emily, and Debbie's not here, but I always 
don't know what term is better. Um, uh, victim, survivor, victim dash survivor. Um, help me with that. And, you know, you can just send me an email or whatever as we as we wordsmith this a little bit because I I I want to you know words matter and I want to use what the community wants to be used. Great. Okay. I, I'm going to move us on to one that, again, hopefully we're close to consensus on. We are not going to go through the laundry list of duties today. I think after we go through membership, vision, mission, tighten all those up, we'll bring something back. Uh, next, what we're going to do, though, is move to structure. And we tried to take both graphically and in words everything that we had heard from everybody uh, to really emphasize we're talking about two entities. One entity focused on adult criminal justice, one focused on juvenile justice with a subset of members. The proposal you'll see in front of you would be for four members from each group to comprise the coordinating council. We will talk about membership following structure. So let's don't uh, get, get too distracted by that just yet. Um, the proposal is that there would be co-chairs, one system person, one community representative. Those would be voted by the group. Each of these work groups or entities would have multiple subcommittees or task forces that are subject and time limited that would involve additional individuals with different perspectives and expertise. Uh, in my limited graphic skills, I tried to demonstrate that you may find one that is an overlap of your two entities. Um, but this is the, the current thinking on the structure. When we get into membership, the current contemplation is 13 uh, in addition to some ex officio non-voting members. Um, in statute, it would de define the input process for identifying the issues to be addressed. The coordinating council that, again, would be selected by each of the entities, their membership, would be a non-voting group. They would work to coordinate the work of the groups and coordinate community outreach, community visits, listening tours. They would organize the annual input from agencies and community groups and provide feedback across the two entities and would be responsible for handling and driving regular communication to system and community-based stakeholders. Um, let me first do as we did uh, early on with a temperature check, not a vote, not an opinion, just in general, does this seem like a structure that you can support? And I'll ask for physical showing of hands. Do you believe this generally is a structure you can support? You would lower your hands. Can I see any hands who generally oppose this structure of the two entities with an overlapping coordinating council? I'm seeing none. Before I go to the roll call vote on this, where we will have the three options, does anybody want to provide commentary? Chair Kane. Yeah, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the role of coordinating council. We. Um, it was very important from what we heard from everybody in reviewing the notes that this needs to be an internal, independent, internally managed group, right? But there was a real need in the testimony that some people didn't know about CCJJ, that, that it wasn't out there publicly, that we needed to get out into the communities. So it was like, how was that going to happen? And so I really felt like if we, this coordinating council not only, you know, received the ideas and spread them out, but also got them from community. That was the outreach group. Obviously, they're going to need to be staffed, right? But, and, you know, take care of every, you know, all of those outreach functions that need to be done and receiving functions to identify what are the issues that these task forces are gonna deal with and get it from community or agencies or the AG's office or from you know, where, whoever wants to have it. So they will be robust people. And then you know, we're like, who should they be? Well, we felt like they should be people who raised their hand in the group, right? Because it will be extra work than showing up at meetings but it will be people who can say, I can do this. And so it doesn't have to be defined like a one community or one ever, because sometimes community people don't have the time, right? And can't do the extra work, right? Um, so, you know, that was in the testimony. Um, so 
we thought this um, structure would work. And I just wanted to explain that a little bit. I yeah, and I, not, I didn't look ahead. I think we agreed or discussed. We even contemplated that ex officio members could be one of these four from each side. Isn't that right? To yeah. Where we land, and we can get yeah, more into we'll that on the members. But I, but, I, but I think this structure really honors kind of the early discussions on having two distinct entities that that drive uh, research and policy recommendations in those given areas, adult and juvenile. Uh, on independent but parallel tracks, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and again, we're going to, on the next slide, and where I expect we'll, we'll have uh, more lengthy conversations, we'll talk membership. Uh, Mr. Chavez has a question online, and then I'll get to Representative Weissman. Thank you, Barrett. Um, I think right now would be a good time to bring up one of my concerns, and I just wanted you all to think about this. I know... Um, a lot of the community had a concern, and we ourselves had concern about um, gatekeeping. And um, I'm a little um, concerned about, well, let me just say that I do like the structure. But what I'm a little concerned about is we, we've we gone from having that huge overarching umbrella gatekeeper to now having two. Um, and I don't, I don't want to see that happen. Um, is it, is it possible to have the task for the task forces, the subcommittees, these focus groups have the voting power um, and, and let them votes come up one by one to make that change instead of having the two um, uh, adult criminal and juvenile justice groups have the voting power? I just want to put that out there and see what you all think about that. Representative Weissman. Um, thank you. That that question or concern from Mr. Chavez essentially replicates mine. I mean, um, contingent on certain understandings, I think the structure on the diagram here um, pretty well does capture um, discussions with that um, colossal asterisk. Um, you know, we, we need to separate adult and, and juvenile and, and you know, I was actually just talking to somebody last night about the role of community members in a very different uh, sort of state um, entity outside of the, the criminal legal system space entirely. The reality is that different folks who do these things in largely a volunteer way, even within the fact that everybody is volunteering lots of time, as folks are here, and thank you, um, some people have more or less within that necessity of needing a lot. So maybe it makes sense. Um, for some folks to self-select and formalize the tie between the two. Okay, uh, I think the much bigger question is exactly as uh, Mr. Chavez just put it. Um, what I think I was hearing a lot of previously is the idea that we need some entity to receive community input, instantiate a task force. Uh, that's the two bigger circles here. Um, that are just marked juvenile justice and adult criminal justice. The task force goes and does the work and they vote amongst themselves, possibly pursuant to voting threshold rules that are you know, developed for all of them, whatever. And then it, it just flows back. There is not a second separate screening function. Uh, the, the, the principal entities are more permanent. I'm imagining that those Appointments go several years. Uh, those folks have to have serious time. The task forces are probably shorter, more of a 12 or 18 month commitment. But I think, the, I feel like the, the bulk of discussion I've heard is that the rubber hits the road at the task force. What is or is not a recommendation back ultimately to the General Assembly and other policymakers happens at the task force. There is supportive work done by the adult and juvenile entities. And, and they certainly have a, a function in voting to say, we're going to have a task force on this or not that in the first place. But then once they have done that, they need to step back from it. That's been my understanding here. And, and um, I mean, frankly, my endorsement of the structure is contingent on that. Well, and I just want to name that, that Mr. Ashley says that, that he agrees with Mr. Chavez's suggestion. Maureen. So I'll tell you why I have a problem with that. It's kind of like saying the bill came forward and it went to the Judiciary Committee and the Judiciary Committee were the experts and they voted it out and it doesn't have to go to the floor for a vote. 
that it goes directly to the to uh, to the other chamber. OK, because that's the role I see that that the that the group plays. The, the task forces are are subject matter experts in their area. They are not necessarily subject matters to the whole vision. And that's so if we believe that Judiciary Committee takes an issue, studies it, recommends it, and it should never have to go to the floor. That's what you're saying. That's the kind of structure you're recommending. And and I I think that for the um honesty or the the value of this group that going to the whole group which if you look at the membership we're proposing is very voice community oriented that that adds an additional layer of experience outside of the you know the particular people who may be experts on you know juvenile brain development but don't know about how to do a transfer hearing, you know? So I just, you know, we've, this has been thrown out and I, I just wanna do the opposite and say, that's where we are. If the committee votes differently and that what's being voted by the task force automatically goes straight up as a recommendation of the council without going through these bodies, then, you know, I think maybe you undermine the credibility of the of the council. Let me get to Mr. Reigns and then back to yeah, Mr. Weissman. I mean, I, I agree with Maureen because I think ultimate in that paradigm, why have the the big group to begin with? Um, other than to say here are some topics. Uh, I think you could address your concern in a and we could get into the weeds down the road on on what would it take for the larger group? So for the group of 13 plus ex officio to stop a task force recommendation. Maybe it's kind of the reverse of the norm where, you know, right now we talk about two thirds approval. Maybe it requires two thirds refusal to stop something. Um, I think there's a way to, to go at it there, but I, I do agree with Maureen that it's got, it's got to trickle up to an entity that when it does finally present something can, can deliver credibility and to all players and as much, you know, whether you're a systems person, it's got to resonate with the systems people, or if you're a community oriented person, it's got to resonate there. And that's, I think in the next few pages, what we tried to address in the membership. Um, so I'm with Maureen on this one. Mr. Weissman, let me just see if I can bring some, some points of clarification and, and bring you in. I, I want to make sure we're understanding your proposal is maybe we require a super majority to reject a recommendation of one of these time subject limited um, for clarity for all members, in terms of memberships of these short-term task forces, are those all members from outside of the entity or might it be a mix of a few members from the juvenile justice entity and a greater number of outside individuals? I envisioned the mix because I did believe that was something that some of the tasks, some of them, not all of them, task forces in CCJJ got right was there were individuals, whether they be from, you know, from the commission that served on task forces also, but I, it, it does have to be a mix. And I think we need more uh, community and subject matter experts in these task forces than we had in the past. I'm gonna bring in Mr. Weissman, and then I'm gonna nudge my friends online to, to join the conversation since uh, I think it's an important issue for us to talk through. Yeah, um, I guess a point speaking for myself and then a point about the bigger group. Um, Interesting analogy that uh, Chair Kane made. I mean, I think a, a critical difference here is that whatever happens with this group, however structured, still has to go through full bicameralism and presentment, uh, most likely through the judiciary committees of the respective uh, houses. So I, I think the the metaphor somewhat is in, imperfect, imperfect in that respect. Um, we have one picture here, and I think underneath the picture are, I was gonna say two, now given Mr. Rain's comment, uh, three different understandings of how the picture could actually work. Uh, pass through, no vote up, no vote down by adult and criminal juvenile justice, option one. Option two, affirmative vote of some threshold up. Uh, option two, affirmative vote of some threshold down. Um, 
I think before there is any action on this page, this proposal, um, we all need to have clarity that we're even all talking about the same thing. Uh, I suspect, um, particularly given you know the folks um, you know online, I think we really need to draw out what and people can think what they want. That's why we're all here is to have different opinions. But um, we all need to understand what we all comprehend by this to be able to discuss it. Understood. So, so let me open this up to some discussion with, uh, I do want to make sure that, that we're clear that the coordinating council is not intended to be a voting body. Uh, so the, the votes, to the extent there are any, would take place in the two entities. Um, I, I'd like to ask for any proposals from the group for that clarity, whether it's a proposal on clarity of how task force membership is selected for the, these uh, time limited bodies, or if anybody would like to make a proposal along the lines of, of what Chair Rain started to articulate of some process by which there is significant weight given to the, the, the task forces, uh, but there is a mechanism uh, by which it could theoretically uh, be reversed. Um, Mr. Weissman, and then I'm going to push people online. Mr. Weissman, do you have any proposals or, or suggestions you'd like to float to the group around either how membership is selected for these task forces or a structure that would get at your concern of how do we empower these task forces without fully neutering the, the entities we're creating? Um, thanks. Let me speak to the second one. I, I think it's possibly the more important of the two. Um, and then I'll come to the first one. I think if uh, somebody, maybe it was Mr. Chavez, used the word gatekeeping. Um, look, I, I want this group to um, come out of here with something that I can go stand firmly behind out there uh, and, and, and advocate for. And there do have to be some differences between the former CCJJ, again, no disrespect, and what we put forward. Um, I think a structure that um, sort of requires, you know, a second affirmative vote um, at the adult or criminal circle level, for lack of better terms, is going to be uncomfortably similar to how things previously were for a lot of folks. Um, it is an interesting proposal by Mr. Reigns to flip it over, particularly with a supermajority threshold. I guess the concern is, a, you know, a task force wasn't representative in somebody's concept or went rogue or something like that. But the whole point here is get the right group together after a thought about what should even be studied in the first place and, and give it some discretion and space um, and, and, and trust in that. And only if two, if so, I don't know, two thirds, three quarters think, wow, you really messed it up. Um, then okay, maybe there's not an imprimatur. Frankly, the work product is already done and a legislator can still pick it up. Now it won't be as badged, but um, I mean, I haven't thought about that one before. That's probably as close as I could get. Um, as to how, um, you know, how task force selection goes, I haven't pushed myself through this exercise, but um, when we start to write a bill for what all we're trying to do here, I think there'd be some pretty general sideboards for the same reason there's been this group is not bigger than it is. And the proposal, you know, on the next page is, is 13. I think for any task force, there'd probably be a minimum and a maximum for the sake of balancing representativeness and functionality. Um, <coughs> past that, I mean, the whole point is these are going to be different. Um, so I don't think we can say there must be an X on every task force because it might not be germane. Conversely, on some task force, maybe we don't want one X, we want four different X's. Um, so I'll have to think about that some more. So Representative Weissman, I, I'm unclear. So if the task forces do, uh, you know, uh, a sentencing reform recommendation and they recommend it, you're saying that if they vote for it, it automatically becomes a recommendation of the of the general counsel, that the council doesn't vote on it, that that they once that that the task force agrees to it, that it, it just goes up. That's your structure. 
That is very certainly a structure that I have heard advocated for and that I have spent time thinking about and that I thought until a little bit ago that we were talking about with more of a shared understanding than I now realize that we are. Um, so I guess to to sum it up, there's 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 pass through no vote and there's a vote up and there's vote down. Um, and I'm I think people's opinions about that start to go in very different ways. I'd like to hear from some of our colleagues uh, on on the wall here because I feel like I'm talking a lot. And I did see Representative Soper's hand up. So I'm going to go to Rep Soper, and then I'm just going to give some warning. Uh, Director Hilke, Mr. Chavez, I'm going to start calling on you. Awesome. Thank you very much. You know, I just wanted to weigh in here a little bit. Uh, that I mean, I certainly believe that our task forces are the engine of this new structure that we're creating here, and that the general subject matter experts are going to be the collective body on the general council. I guess as far as selecting the membership on the task force, I, I kind of agree with Representative Weissman that it's going to be fluid depending on what the task force is supposed to do, that sometimes you're going to want a different makeup. And I actually think the general council could be the one in charge of who that membership ought to be, and that the general council could say, okay, perhaps there's a few of us that want to serve um, on this task force because we have that expertise, but they may also say, we also want to specifically go out and have four more members who are, you know, X category of just fill in the blank. And that I actually think that we empower the general counsel to come up with how big the task force is going to be and the exact membership that they want. Thank you, Representative. Uh, so I'm going to propose to the group, and you're welcome to push back or kick me, um, that adds to membership, um, including on these task forces, we hold that for right now until our conversation about membership. Um, and we try to focus on this decision-making process and structure uh, between task forces and the respective entities. And I think that the big um, place uh, 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 of gridlock right now is if a task force makes a recommendation, is that final and that becomes the recommendation of the body that advances to the elected officials or should there be a mechanism of some type of vote within the entity to which that task force reports that allows them some opportunity to vote reverse or take action on that um, and, and would love to uh, director Hilke, whether it's you or tristan or ubaldo or anybody i think we've got a, a real power dynamic ideological conversation to have and would like to get some thoughts on the table. Mr. Chavez, please jump in. Yeah, so I, I feel like if if we have this this well thought up and um, structured general counsel, they're going to develop the task at hand and um, the idea or the issue that needs to be discussed in, in the task forces and voted on. And these people will be made up as such where they can um, put these ideas forward and, and have faith in these um, lower task forces to come up with the right vote. And I'm okay with the idea of a supermajority vote down if if it's just out of control and and people really can't agree on it. Um, I'm okay with the mechanism, but if we want something innovative, if we want something different, the unicorn that all of us have been talking about, um, I feel like this is the way to go. I feel like it's giving the power into the focus groups and then and then that general counsel guiding those task forces in a way that we can trust that those those votes are going to be um coming back with um with expertise and with uh with a lot of a lot of thought going into them and and that and I feel like that can that can be something that we can take out to the public and say hey this is this is different 
and, and we got a safety mechanism in place to make sure that um something bad doesn't happen but but um but the general structure is different than what we had in the past or than whatever anyone else has and i think that if we really have a real discussion about it we can make something work thank you mr chavez um Beric, this is stan i i want to make sure that i i've, I've I guess I'm going to admit here that I'm I got a little confused about the the blue circle on the page just let's just talk about the blue circle adult criminal justice are we calling that a council or a task force so I want to make sure I understand exactly what we're talking about I appreciate that director and I don't think it's you I think we have all used different words interchangeably uh for sake of discussion why don't we call that a commission um the council referring to the coordinating council of combined membership, and then the task forces refer to the time limited subject specific uh, work groups. Okay. And then uh, this is a little bit of a question for Maureen. I wanted to I wanted to make sure I was clear on what you were advocating for, Maureen. Were you were you advocating that a task force would make a recommendation up, and that would come from a vote within, and then it would be um, again ratified through a vote at the Adult Criminal Justice Council? Um, yes. Okay. Um, for some of the reasons I stated and others that are still wandering around in my brain. Yeah. That's, I, I tend to agree with Maureen in this regard. I, I feel, you know, I, I, I guess I, uh, I hear the issue of what people described as gatekeeping, but I also feel like there's power in doing the work to get to this place because uh, having having gone through CCJJ and not trying to replicate it, I do know that um, it's probably easier to get an idea generated and voted on at a task force level, but um, it, it, in order to gain the strength of the idea, that second vote at the criminal justice council the adult criminal justice or the juvenile either one of them um i feel like needs to take place to sort of ratify the strength of the idea yeah and if i could just jump in here another reason and just having lived with ccjj way too long and really trying to flip how the membership works because i think we need to talk about that because if people feel more comfortable with that going through this adult or juvenile commission maybe seems less threatening or less gatekeeping um, to people. But if you have the task force's recommendations immediately, you know, become the commission's recommendations, then every task force becomes another political analysis of who the members are. You know, there's the, the for every the creation of every task force will not necessarily be an analysis of what it'll be. Every time you do it, you're going to be balancing it because the votes are going to derive the final recommendation, and and knowing that that's that's an issue and trying to create a balanced membership in the commission itself, right? That that we know we have it there then it's less of a struggle every time you create a task force um, because, you know, you may not, you, 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 you don't want to assess sides every time you create a task force, right? I mean, so that's, that's my concern operationally. There may be the smartest people in the room, may be other people that, you know, that, Tom won't hate because they're too liberal, you know, that Tom will hate because they're too liberal, but they might be, you know, but if he knows it's going to go through a commission vote, he doesn't have to get all that upset every time there's a task force, right? Right, Tom? Uh, I'm, <laughs> no, gonna... I'm just, this is a lot, just a logistic, I'm just going to throw out that, you know, um, I think it gives the commission more freedom to have the right people at the task force. Mm -hmm. No, I, I've got Director Stancil's had his hand up online. I want to get to the director. Then I'm going to come in the room to Janet. And then I'm going to share back what the three paths that I'm hearing 
and then we can consider whether we want to talk membership and revisit those. Uh, but Director Stancil, to you first, and then back into the room. So I have a question, and then I'll, I'll weigh in based upon this question. I remember, uh, and I'm still relatively new to the, the state government because I came from the feds. Um, so I remember there was a conversation a couple of meetings ago about a, a limited number of bills being able to be introduced. Is that going to pertain to this committee as well? Because if that's the case, then if we have, let's say, eight different task forces, is that going to go against the number of bills that we're able to push forward from this committee is, is I guess, my first question. And then I can and, wait. And, and then I'll, I'll ask Maureen. I, we have not yet fully resolved the question of bill writing uh, authority. That'll be part of what we'll talk about in, in final structure and, and where it's housed. Um, but I think you raise a question for everybody to be considered. If the, either of these commissions were granted, whether that's three or five bill titles, um, and you had these task forces that consumed five of them, it, it's a reality. Now, now, I think somebody else, and maybe it was Rep Soper, said this is the engine where the work is happening. But Chair Reigns, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an issue. Obviously, the way CCJJ operated was just recommendations, and there would be years we'd have 15 or 20 of them, and it was up to legislators to pick and choose if they wanted to run with one of those ideas. So I think there is value in having that, um, and I'm already forgetting the name of the big group here, big group, <laughs> big group gets to maybe with, you know, with, in dialogue with the multiple task forces, say we need to prioritize and pick five that work this year. That doesn't mean the recommendations aren't still out there and could be picked up. But uh, I like the idea, you know, I think Rep Weissman has alluded to this in the past meetings of giving some bill status to this. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing that worked in. So I think it could work that way. So we've still got to address that. Director Stancil, did you want to continue? And then I'm going to go to Janet and then Director Hilke. Yeah, I, well, I think for me, that's going to be a big part of it because if if that is going to play against, if that is going to count against what we're able to push forward, and I definitely think there needs to be some, some. I know no one likes this term, but oversight of what's going, if it's going to reduce the number of what we can push forward. So um, I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you, uh, Director. Janet and then Director Hilke. Thank you. I really appreciate everybody's effort to be creative and innovative in this structure, but I also want to just draw out some of the positive things that existed with CCJJ. And that was, we were trying to reach consensus and we were trying to do that through negotiation and compromise. But when we were able to reach agreement, there was some obligation on the members to stand behind the recommendations. And then when those recommendations came forward in the form of bills or formal policy recommendations, the council stood together behind those things. And if we developed a structure like we've talked about where these small specialized task forces voted and it never went through the larger council or maybe not larger, but the, the more formal council that was permanent, I think those members wouldn't want to be bound by the tax task force recommendations. And as a result, the recommendations would lose some of their credibility and weight as they move forward to policymakers. So that's a concern that I have about the innovative idea we've been kicking around and it causes me to lean more in favor of the structure Maureen and Director Hilke have talked about. Thank you, Janet. Director Hilke. Yeah, I appreciate that comment, Janet, for sure. I think you make a valid point. Uh, I was going to speak to Director Stancil's comment um, about the number of bills. I, I'm not worried too much about that. I think even if we got bill writing authority, then it would put put some group, whether it's a coordinated council or in concert with everybody else, in the business of prioritizing the recommendations that came out 
but that doesn't mean at the exclusion of the opportunity for other legislators to pick up the other recommendations that are not prioritized. So in other words, I don't think we would be locked into just supporting our own five or whatever that would be if, if it looks that way. I think it would just be a matter of, you know, the group prioritizing things and then those other ones are always available to be picked up by other people as well. So I, I'm worried less about that. Thank you, Director. Chair Reigns. Um, maybe getting far afield on the on the designating bills, but I almost want to reverse my opinion on it. Uh, just given the experience in this building, you get tell someone they get five bills, they're going to come up with five bills. And, and I would hate to get to where, uh, oh, we have five bills, we have to have five bills, whereas the recommendations are always out there for legislators. So that may just be a better course of action. Thank you. Uh, as I'm listening to everybody, we really are, are talking about one of three paths when, yeah. when it comes to this. Path one is these task forces. I'm sorry, Maureen, did you want to? Yeah, I just want to hear from um, Vincent and Tristan about this because there are people that wanted small groups with their own recommendation power um, and make sure that's, you know, if you have any other thoughts, you can contribute. Um, or Emily or when some anybody else that hasn't spoken before we take any kind of straw vote because it will influence people. I, I'm not seeing any hands. So, so okay. Madam Chair, let me just share. Mr. Atchity, please jump in. Thanks, and thanks, Maureen. I'm just listening carefully to all of the different arguments and uh, don't necessarily have a fixed opinion that won't be changeable one way or another. But, um, you know, what I heard from someone's suggestion was the notion that the coordinating or the, the adult or juvenile body might have the capacity to vote down something by a supermajority and that would be that would put a kind of control a safety control in place and then the legislative process itself of course has multiple steps in it with additional opportunities for checks to things um beyond that i don't have a anything to contribute so as i'm hearing everybody I, i'm really hearing three paths we could go down. Uh, and to be very clear, I'm not advocating any of these. I'm just reflecting back out what I'm hearing. One path at one end is these task forces take their votes, and that is the final vote. That's determinative, and that recommendation moves forward. At the other end of the spectrum would be they take their vote, and these permanent commissions can do whatever they want or don't want to do with those votes, with no heeding to it, just the consideration of it. In the middle, what I'm hearing is different versions of the task force drives the work and brings their recommendation to the permanent standing commissions who have some authority to overrule that by what I'm hearing would be some form of to be determined supermajority, whether that's two thirds or three quarters. But that's kind of what I'm hearing is absolute control to the task forces at one end limited to any, they're just recommendation bodies that the commissions can do anything they want with, or they are they carry weight and would have to be overturned by a supermajority. Does there anybody see anything other than those three with the under, the big caveat that what that overturning mechanism would be is still to be discussed? Mr. Weissman. Um, thank you. Um, I'm making this up as I go, so maybe this is dangerous. Um, I appreciate the reference, and I think it was um, maybe Director Stansel who brought this up. Okay, what about bills? We haven't gone through that yet, but at some point, um, that is a necessary um, sort of limiting function. Um, I, I don't think, at least in my concept, there were never going to be seven or eight or nine task forces at once. There were going to be a few. They're, they're meant to be intensive and, and have some time, I don't know, 12, 18 months, and those are not casual things. And, you know, there were always a couple, well, I shouldn't even say always, there were often a few things going on at CCJJ, but, and, you know, one would start and then overlap and one would end earlier and, you know, it was just fluid, but to the extent of two or three and not eight or nine or 10 was my sense of it always. 
So anyway, we have a few task forces and depending on the task force and the issue, I mean, it might emit one idea. It might emit, I don't know, seven. Um, supposing we're going to give bill authority or even bill badging to the adult commission and the juvenile commission, three each, total of six. Um, now you have a scarcity condition and, and, um, I'll try to finish the thought and then invite commentary on it. Um, you have task forces that have put forth a total of eight ideas. I think that you, you accurately captured the discussion thus far. Maybe a fourth option is something like this. The, a task force doesn't get bill authority. It gets idea authority. Uh, and and it, it puts out a report and, and that is there and a legislator could pick it up. But because there's very likely going to be more ideas or recommendations from task forces than bill authority is granted. Um, now, maybe it's the role of the commission uh, to say, okay, you know, we like all of these. We're not voting them down and we're not presuming to say, oh, we're going to give you our seal of approval in some abstract way or not. But the reality is there are fewer bills than there are ideas. So, you know, maybe we want to approve this as a bill and not that, but the other one still stands as the final work product of the task force. Uh, and it could be picked up by a legislator in the form of a bill. Um, uh, if somebody wants, or I don't know, maybe I've just made that way too complicated and we should fall back to Mr. Rain's idea of super majority to disapprove. So with the chair's permission, I'd like to see if we can do a straw poll on these hybrid options, if that's okay. Um, so I'm going to put to the group for not a formal roll call vote, just a straw poll on where you stand, two options. One would be that the work is done at these task force levels, these subcommittees, they make a recommendation that goes to the permanent standing commission and that entity has some to be determined supermajority requirement if they are going to overturn or not advance that recommendation. The second straw poll item I will put in front of you will be based on what Mr. Weissman just proposed, that if there is bill writing authority that rests with the permanent entities, that the task force recommendations are published, are released, can be picked up by a legislator but it re rests solely in the body, in the decision-making of the permanent commissions of whether they are going to use their bill writing authority to act on one of the recommendations from a task force. Let me go to the first one, which may be the simpler, but I'm not judging which, which is better, just easier for me to describe. And that is the task forces will do the work. They will take a vote. That vote will be advanced to the commission. The commission will have the authority still to be determined, are we talking two thirds or three quarters? And then we get into nuance of two thirds or three quarters uh, of total membership or those in attendance, but some ability to override that recommendation. By a show of hands, subject to our discussion of membership, who could support a structure as depicted on, on the slide and where the, commit, the standing committees have a supermajority right to override? Can I see a show of hands of who could support such a structure? I have five in the room. I see four, five, six online. Do I have anybody who would oppose such a structure? Mr. Thank you. I see nobody opposing. Let me now move to the second one and then we can decide if we want to go to a vote. The second option would be that the decision, the votes happen at the task force, but they do not have the bill writing authority. That, if we get it, rests solely at the commissions. Can I see a show of hands of those who would support that structure? Maureen, are you wanting to comment or question? I want to comment really quick because I we didn't really discuss um, Representative Weissman's most recent proposal that we're showing, raising our hands about now. It is in some ways similar 
to how the mental health oversight committee operates because the oversight committee, which is legislators, and then there's task forces and they make recommendations and the oversight committee has a number of bills and all the recommendations are presented to them and they vote for their what they're gonna give a bill to. So that is what you're basically saying that, that um, the task forces make recommendations, but this commission, the big group, the unicorn, uh, the pink unicorn um, votes by by deciding that they have bill writing authority for X number of bills and they prioritize that way. And the recommendations hang out there. If the task force wants to lobby a legislator to take up their recommendation, um, that gets a little sticky, but you know, I uh, okay. appreciate the reference. I think also rough analogies to uh, the, there's a legislative oversight committee with a task force on sales and use tax. Um, that's yet a different one than the general tax policy one I was on that I, I keep talking about. Um, you have these expert tax forces, they generate ideas. Uh, they may or may not beget legislation, certainly. And those entities are empowered with legislation to bring forward. Uh, if uh, we see that, okay, it's got more of a degree of imprimatur. Yes, there are other ideas. Example, I mean, the, the task force of the committee that I was on, I mean, they they write up a couple of 20, 30 page, very detailed discussions of really intricate stuff every year, even if it doesn't turn into a bill, it's there. We know who was part of it. Anybody could go and say, all right, I want to do this thing about shifting to an AGI base instead of an FDI base, but you have more of a case to make. Some some work is done. Some imprimatur is there. It's just not the same imprimatur as if the whole committee picked it up. So multiple analogies. Yeah. So so I there's some things I like about it, but there's also some things that I think could get really squirrely about it. And still, my then the task forces and the selection of them becomes much more political. I think even under that design. Yeah. I'm gonna. Go ahead, Mr. Rains, and I'm going to read a comment from the chat. That's that's kind of where I was going, Maureen. Um, I think it does amp up the politics, but I also, I, I wonder, uh, I always love Maureen's phrase, play the movie. Um, when this comes before the legislature, the credibility of the two ideas. So you have one, three ideas that have moved up, up the ladder and gotten full endorsement, and then you've got a legislator bringing, hey, I know this one didn't get to jump through hoop two, but it was a recommendation down here of this group. How does that, Yeah, I, I think you lose some ground with that. That's just my perspective on it. Yeah, and there might be six really good ideas. You know, it, then it's gonna get limited to the number of bills that are allocated. And and then do they have to pick? And I don't want the, the big group to have to pick if they think uh, we like all six ideas, you know, or eight ideas, so. I, just in, in terms of what the median legislator will expect based on reference to other structures, um, to say that there is unlimited bill emitting authority, I think is um, unprecedented as to interim structures. Now, um, OSA can, can vote out bills. I think it requires, or LAC rather, Legislative Audit Committee, um, can emit bills. I think that requires unanimity. JBC can emit bills, but these are legislative committees now. So the analogy breaks down. Um, I mean, every every committee is used to having, and I mean a full up member based interim committee, never mind task forces, is used to having more ideas than they get bills. Um, I mean, it, it used to be quite uncapped. I was on an interim committee that probably drafted 19 or 20 bills for five titles. Finally, we changed the joint rules to be more respectful of nonpartisan staff who have to draft all those bills and fiscal analyze them. Now you're limited to double. So I was on a committee that got five bills. We drafted 10. Yeah, hard choices had to be made. And, and I have seen it where an idea is surfaced and is even drafted by an interim committee, and it just doesn't make the final cut, and a member picks it up and tries to make the case. Um, I don't think that's automatically a, a bad thing. It does mean that legislators and everybody else in the regular session process does need to know the difference. But you know, when, when they print the bill, it'll say, um, use an actual example from a couple of years ago, you know, wildfire matters interim committee and 
bold font on the front of the page. That means it's actually an interim bill. A, a, a member picked up an idea from that committee a couple of years ago, um, and it, it didn't have that because it wasn't because it didn't come out. So it is there's that data point right there on the front of the page. I'm going to read a comment from Director Hilke, then bring Ms. Drake in, and then I'm going to reflect what I'm hearing uh, and ask a question so we see if we can't take some votes here. Uh, Director Hilke uh, said, I think Rep. Weissman's comments about the number of task forces under each respective council is a point that should not be lost. Remember, each of these needs to be staffed and facilitated, not to mention monitored for compliance with open meeting issues. Mention this often, but the workload issue cannot be overstated. Uh, Ms. Drake. Thank you. I appreciate that point also. Um, one of my concerns about this structure that we've been talking about where things could elevate out of a task force without any further review from the pink unicorn is that it, I, I'm questioning, is it binding on the members of the unicorn? And that's important to me because I think it waters down the um, strength of the recommendation, if it's coming into the Capitol for a bill and you're going to allow people who sit on that council to come in and testify against recommendations that are made from the task force. But I don't feel like it's good due process to bind members of the council or commission if they don't have an opportunity to vote and express their opinion about what the bill says or about what the recommendation is. Thank you. Uh, let, let me reflect what I'm hearing, and then I'm going to ask our chairs and, and Rep. Weissman a, a question. Um, at this time, we had unanimous straw poll, non-binding, could support the structure as shown with the high threshold for a, a, an override. Um, we have this, uh, I, I would say, not yet fully flushed out potential uh, of bill writing versus not. Uh, my question for Representative Weissman is if you'd like to propose a vote on the alternative structure and or if we want to hold a formal roll call vote on the structure with the override threshold. I acknowledge I made things a bit messy by uh, kicking out another idea at the last um, minute here. I mean, the the the, the issue of bills um, was always going to come up and I, I kind of jumped ahead. I mean... I, I don't know. Did, did we even have that in here? Maybe we hadn't gotten there yet. Uh, uh, threshold question, is there bill writing authority at all? And then how does that go? Um, I mean, just like we're going to have to grapple with that issue anyway. Um, hmm. I don't know. And I, I, you know, I'm, Eric, you're you're tracking um, the wall better than I can. I want to make sure we're not missing anybody else uh, who's who's on remotely here. Um, you know, I, I if it if it's it, it can't be less than two thirds. Um, I, I do have a strong reaction to the idea that the task force does its thing and then it it still needs to gain, you know, majority or even super majority approval from the. But I, I think we moved on from that. And that's good. If we're talking about it, it is presumed approved, certainly there'll be discussion. There should be discussion. It's it's presumed approved by the commission, the unicorn, whatever word we're using, unless two thirds the other way. That, all right, that's different, you know. But that 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 gives it, that puts more deference in the the task force, um, and I think is at least partially responsive to some of what all we've been hearing. And again, I, I'm neither advocating nor proposing. I, I'm reflecting that that is what I'm hearing from the group. So I'd like to propose at this point a, a roll call vote on the structure shown with the minimum two thirds entity uh, vote to overrule. We okay to do that vote? So the roll call vote is for the structure as shown in the PowerPoint with the understanding that the recommendations of the time-limited subcommittees or task forces stand unless a vote of a minimum of two-thirds of the permanent entity votes to overrule. We will get to bill writing in, in subsequent conversations. Uh, with that being the vote, um, 
and I'm going to ask strictly for a support or oppose on this one, since I think we've addressed revisions. Mr. Atchity. Yeah, I could support that. Thank you. Chair Kane. Mr. Chavez. I support. Ms. Drake. I support. Tristan Gorman. Support. Director Hilke. I had a quick question. In the, what's the strength of the vote that comes out of the task force? I think that's a, a, a fair question. We, we do need to, to tag that. Is there a proposal on that? Are we going to require them to have a minimum two thirds to advance? I'm seeing nods in the room. We, we haven't discussed. I, I think we would need to have a separate discussion on that. Well, my vote would be in support of it contingent upon there's a super majority vote coming out of the task force. Understood, recorded as such, thank you. Mr. Lester. Support. Mr. Raines. Support. Director Stansel. Support. Ms. Terranova. She may have had to jump off. Emily. <laughs> support. Thank you. Representative Weissman. I can support. We have mostly unanimous with, with the if contingency from Director Hilke. So let me bring that issue to this group and let's go ahead and see if we can't close that out. And then we'll move on to membership. The question before us is what is the vote threshold for a recommendation or idea to come from a task force up to the permanent commissions? Would anybody like to just open up the conversation on that? I mean, I'm, I would just keep it simple. I, I'm good with two thirds. I know CCJJ started it higher than that which I was a proponent of for a long time, but um, two thirds is adequate to me to move something forward. Do we I have agree with that, Tom. Director Hilke agrees. Do we have differing proposals on the two thirds threshold? Mr. Weissman. Let me throw a simple majority out there. Mr. Weissman proposes a simple majority, 50 plus one. Do we have any proposals other than simple majority and two thirds? I'm going to go ahead with a roll call vote. You'll be able to vote on either or. I will first ask for those in support of a two thirds vote from the task forces to recommend an idea. On the standard of two thirds from a task force, Mr. Atchity. Um, can I vote and comment at the same time? Sure. I mean, I would support two thirds just because if the task force can't get to two thirds, they're just not done doing the work yet. Thank you. Ms. Kane. Mr. Chavez. I support. Mr. Chavez supports two thirds. Ms. Drake. I support two thirds. Two thirds. Tristan. Support two thirds. Support two thirds. Director Hilke. I support two thirds. Mr. Lester. I support two thirds. Mr. Raines. Support. Mr. Stansel. Support. Victoria, we have lost Emily. Support two thirds. Mr. Weissman. I'll just stand on majority for now, but it's all right. The will of the group is is clear. Um, I mean, look, I I, I appreciate the the fact that two thirds necessarily reflects. Uh, further work toward consensus. Um, and I think Mr. Atchity put that, put that well. Um, there have been very sharply diverging views 
on vote thresholds in the past. Um, and I, we just all need to keep our heads up about that is what I'll say. And I will also offer, and I don't think we resolve this now, uh, there will be a, a further task and conundrum for this group of what you ask to be placed in statutory language and, and what becomes the, the rules adopted by any of these entities. Uh, so there'll be some further thinking on that. Uh, with that, it is three, it's 309. We're a little past when I had hoped to give everybody a break. Uh, we will reconvene at 320 sharply and dig into membership. I don't know if you realize what just.
It is 319. So in these last 30 seconds, we'll let everybody get seated uh, and then we will resume. I, I greatly appreciate everybody working through uh, the simple issues. Now we get complex. Uh, I, I thought that was some great progress we made. Um, obviously, we're in good shape on mission and on structure. We're going to do some revisions on vision and circulate that so we can vote at a to be scheduled meeting upcoming. Uh, what we have remaining this afternoon is to get through the issues of membership and where these entities will be housed, what they will call home, and some basic conversations around the staffing and supports for them. Uh, up first, though, is going to be the membership. You will see a draft proposal membership. I do want to call out, if you're looking at the screen or you're looking at home, you have the most recent. If you're looking at a printed version in front of you, I will call out that where you see lines for um, one, or it says two advocates uh, or victims or, or their advocates, uh, look at the, the screen uh, online. I just clarified that. Unfortunately, we had already printed it, uh, but that should be one victim or survivor under adults and one advocate for victims or survivors uh, and similar language uh, on the juvenile side. It's just the difference between all of those have been grouped together and it said two of, and it should be one of each. Um, but I'm gonna read through first the adult. We'll have some conversation. I know we already have one proposal relating to the ex officio members. Each of these has been structured based on the input we received during our last meeting. And those of you who are able to complete the Google form to offer ideas, the suggestion is that there be 13 voting members plus six non-voting. In the case of the adult entity structured as two prosecutors representing urban and rural, one public defender, one private criminal defense bar or ADC appointee, one representative of law enforcement, one from local government, one academic or research professional, one mental health professional, one substance use disorder professional, one victim or survivor, one advocate for victims and survivors, one formerly incarcerated, and one advocate for the formerly or currently incarcerated. In addition to those voting members, the initial proposal is for uh, six non-voting members consisting of three legislators, one from the judicial, one from the Department of Corrections, and one representing the governor's office. Uh, let me first ask for any questions or if we want to go straight into reactions or proposals on these. Mr. Weissman, I think we, we have one from you, so I'm just going to go straight to it and stop playing coy. Uh, sure, and, and um, Rep. Soper had to go present a bill. Uh, he shared this with me by text. I, I find myself somewhat agreeing. It's down to the ex officio members. Um, three out of presumptively four majority minority party times two chambers is a bit unusual, and, and Rep. Soper's suggestion was just make that four with the presumption of uh, chair and ranking member of the respective judiciary committees. I would tend to agree. I, I know there's been uh, the concern of the ability of legislators given schedules to attend. I think we're talking EXO here. So it's really informational. You know, I, I hope that there is attendance. We could talk about, does it say chair and ranking or designee? Um, but I mean, ultimately we're formulating um, uh, legislative policy here. Uh, so I think that that touch point in a non-voting way could hopefully be helpful. I think clarifying that um, there's equal representation by party helps take some politics out of it. So that's the suggestion I'd make just at, at the bottom for exit. But before I open it up to overall membership, uh, if we could have a brief discussion on Representative Weissman's uh, offer on behalf of Mr. Soper, uh, that we increase from three legislators to four legislators. Uh, and I'll also open it up to thoughts on, is it uh, delineated who that is, that it's ranking members of, of Judiciary Committee? Do we leave it open to their designee? Or is it to the majority of the minority parties to nominate who they would like to? Sure. Um, I mean, to me, the I think the logical starting point is, um, well, we can go back and look at the um, the CCJJ language. I mean, there's been sort of an, an informal culture, or there used to be an informal culture in House Judiciary where the, the Judiciary Chair was not on 
uh, CCJJ, rather another member was. I, I never was. I, Pete Lee was not what he chaired. Um, this is so that other other members could get involved, and one of ours did. Um, there are things to be said for that. Uh, if you were to back it up and we were to codify just, you know, designations by the parties, I mean, I guess that allows maximum flexibility. Um, in reality, it, it's going to come back down to your chair and your ranking member most of the time. But if we are codifying and for the sake of flexibility, I mean, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's there's two things. We could say chair and ranking, and everybody knows who those are, uh, or those persons designees, or if we wanted to be a little bit maybe more mindful of sort of leadership prerogative, you would say just you know, basically one member, each chamber, each party, you know, indicated by their leadership. And I think that's going to be chair and ranking most of the time. And I'm certainly not advocating, again, I'm just reflecting that there were some comments from some stakeholders about ensuring we had representatives from things like mental health and other aspects. But I have no preference. I just want to get clear on the language so we can adjust it here. Ms. Kane. I, I just want to talk about membership and before we start the discussion about some of the thought process that went into this list, um, it specifically excludes judicial, legislative, and executive as voting members. Um, so um, that was purposeful, yes. Um, so, and it it tried to highlight people without specifically designating it but people on the on the ground i realize we put two prosecutors and two defense lawyers on it and again that's my apology if people think that's too much but I, our experience was that groups need lawyers to say this is what the law is and this is how we play it out in the law so and that it needed to be balanced but if people have a problem with that totally get that. And um, um, we went through the list of that everybody submitted and all the notes of where people wanted and realized that everybody talked about not tokens, but unfortunately, I think everybody's going to be in some ways representative of of the constituency that, you know, that they're a part of. So um, but all of this is open for discussion, but the 13 would be the voting. And then if we add, you know, seven more, we'd get to 20. Um, I'm going to bring in chair Reigns, and then we've got comments from director Hilke and Mr. Atchity. So I'll bring them in after chair Reigns. Yeah. And, and I think just, just bear in mind, just in the, in the back of your mind, as you look at this list, remember, this is just the group that's going to help create the task forces that will, so depending on the topic, you know, you're going to have far more mental health people or far more um, behavioral health people, depending on the topic of the task force. So. Director Hilke. A couple of things. I, I do agree with, uh, with Rep Wiseman's comments about adding a fourth legislature. Three is awkward. Uh, it, it needs to be balanced. And then, you know, whether or not that's appointed by leadership or whatever, I guess, leave it up to them. Uh, two other comments about voting members, um, taking into account what Tom just said, that yes, task force, you know, the task forces are going to be where subject matter experts are at as well. But um, these lists both leave out a CDPS employee who seems to be, I don't, maybe that's just an oversight or perhaps, you know, a reaction to the former CCJJ. I'm not sure. Uh the the law enforcement one, um, I get why we're trying to limit it, but I think that's going to be a little bit problematic um, because many times the chiefs differ from the sheriffs or sheriffs differ from the chiefs. And uh, it, it begs the question then for me is who's going to be appointing these people? Um, because then that starts to become more of a political appointment that, uh, you know, Based on it, it could always I could see it in a current environment where the it would always be a chief of police, perhaps, or in a different environment, might always be a sheriff. 
or a sheriff's office employee. So uh, I just throw that out there as, as a potential alligator under the surface. Thank you, Director. And in our next slide, we are going to get into the, the appointing and authorizing agency. Uh, so we'll talk about who will be making these appointments, but I've got your notes uh, about questions about the, the absence of CDPS uh, and the need to look at law enforcement broadly to for the different perspectives of police and sheriffs. Uh, let me go to Mr. Atchity and then Director Stansel. Uh, just my comment was just looking at the list of recommended members and not seeing mental health advocate on there and suggesting that, that might make sense. Not exactly the same thing as a mental health professional as it's not affiliated with any particular practice area, but a broader sense of needs and unmet needs of the population. Thank you, Mr. Atchity. And I'm gonna get all of the comments in and then we'll have a discussion. Mr. Stansel. I was just curious, what is the thinking behind um, <clears throat> DOC being a non-voting member? Because both of these are going to impact, have the potential to impact what we do. So I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, what was the, the thinking behind that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll be candid, I think, here which uh, some of the heartburn for the softest word over the last few years in regard to executive offices was undue influence perception, whether real or imagined. And, and you know, similarly on the other side of that coin from, from some folks that I worked with in, in, in my constituencies, same thing applied to some legislators. So the ex officio was to say, you're involved, your input is there, um, you're engaged, but when it comes to, to voting on who goes on the task forces, we wanted to try and insulate ourselves as best we could from the politics of the executive office and the politics of the legislative branch. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I got back to the meeting. Like, I didn't know that this was just determining the voting members on the task force. I thought this was just overall uh, the ability to vote on issues as they come up. So I apologize for that. Yeah, I think no, I want to make sure we're on the same page. Um, you would be participating in the in the what are we calling this one? You, the, the large group, the unicorn, what, the adult entity, but you would not be voting. You would not be one of the veto voters on on something coming up from a task force. And you could also be a member of a task force and or the coordinating committee as an ex officio member, depending on the will of the of the group. Yeah, so. I think that's important if the majority of the work is going to be in the task force. And there are a lot of things that we do that that DOC won't be involved with. And there's some that they will be involved with. And then they would be voting members on the task force, but ex officio on the in the larger group. That was the idea that the, that that agency, uh, you know, we go back to the kind of the um vision and mission statement that it's centered around people that are out there in communities and doing the work in, in, uh, out there and that the uh, agencies participate, but don't um, get told by anybody's bosses, this is how they vote. <laughs> so, Mr. Weiss, to be honest. Um, Thank you. Uh, so rewinding to my comments about legislators, I want to be clear. I, I think ex officio is fine. I'm obviously we all get involved later. I'm not asking for more. I do think four is better than three. We could leave it at pointed by their respective leadership and go from there. Um, I appreciate Mr. Rain's point. Um, you know, perception of reality in the minds of different beholders. I've long said politics is akin to Lockean epistemology and the to be is to be perceived. So at some point it's the same problem. Um, for that reason, I, I and I appreciate the substantial role that DPS has had in staffing CCJJ in the past. And, and I'm sure that uh, DCJ and, and whatever it becomes renamed to this year will have some role in staffing going forward, but I, I do think it's appropriate that respectfully that DPS not be written in as a voting member and that DOC not be written in as a voting member for the reasons that Mr. Reigns articulated. 
uh, and, and plenty of stuff I've heard myself over the years, when there are bills, very much those departments will become involved. I think 100 legislators out of 100 in this building very much understand the way in which the executive branch uh, chooses to involve itself in the legislative process. We, when, when we're doing a bill, we want it to work operationally. We, you know, if there's a bill touching DOC, of course we work with DOC and sometimes drafting changes are made. Um, likewise with DPS. So legislators do get involved later in the legislative process. Frankly, so do executive departments. So the ability to, to be heard is very much there just a bit later. So I'd like to invite any member, we've heard a couple of folks uh, provide their rationale for why we don't have agency staff, whether that's DOC or CDPS. I wanna open it up to the group to offer either uh, aligned or differing opinions on that. We also had a comment from Director Hilke about the law enforcement representation uh, and the difference between police chiefs and, and sheriffs and whether it's the, the associations appointing uh, and I welcome thoughts on uh, if and how to address that, Mr. Weissman. Yeah, sorry, thank you for the reminder. Look, I, I agree with Director Hilke. Like it, those organizations are not the same. They should not be taken to be the same. They have different roles and they land in different places on legislation sometimes. That's just accurate. Um, two thoughts in mind. One is we, we could specify that, um, you know, and when we get to the drafting point, you want staggered terms, right? So we'll have to decide which appointments initially go for two years and which for three, and we'll figure that out. But you could have it that the initial appointment to the adult entity is from the chiefs and the additional appointment to the juvenile entity is from the sheriffs and they alternate. Or you could leave that open um, and you could have it that, um, you know, appointments are gonna go for X years and they have to alternate. So, you know, uh, chief's representative for two years followed by sheriff's representative for two years I've even seen drafting for setting up task forces and, and such where um, certain appointing authorities go first and a, another appointing authority can't go until the first one has gone. And then such choices as were made by the earlier in time appointing authority uh, have to be taken into account and, and might even foreclose certain options. Uh, on the part of the later in time appointing authority when we get to talking about exec versus legislative appointments. It risks encumbering the drafting, but I've seen those moves made to address some of the concerns we're talking about here. Thank you. Uh, other thoughts from members in the room or online on agency staff uh, exclusion, um, the, the issue raised by Director Hilke and just uh, a, a, an answer offered by Mr. Weissman about the difference in police chiefs versus sheriffs uh, Mr. Weissman suggesting alternating terms there. Um, and we had Mr. Atchity raise uh, the absence of a mental health advocate, um, stating that, that he felt, viewed that a mental health professional is, is different. Would anybody like to weigh in on any of those issues or on any other inclusions or exclusions from this member's list as proposed for the adult entity? Ms. Are we gonna do a roll call vote on this uh, soon then? We, we will, yes. Uh, do you need to get going in the next few minutes, sir? No, I I, I do want to make a comment then if if we're going to um, right. do a vote. Let me, and, and this is to Stan's comment about DPS. You know, one of the things kind of, you know, added on at the end is somebody from the governor's office and that as an ex officio, and maybe that needs to be public safety. But when we were thinking about the governor's office, we were thinking about somebody from the policy team so that there was never the disconnect because for the, you know, the years that we spent, it used to be that the governor sent somebody to CCJJ so they knew what was going on and that didn't stop happening. And sometimes they would listen in, but, and then we would be stuck. We would, <laughs> probably separately or sometimes together, we would be called in to explain what was going on in our groups to the governor's policy people. And we thought as an ex officio member, they would to keep the executive active in this. Um, that's why we put that there, but maybe that should be a, you know, a public safety person who can then talk to the policy people. I don't know, but Stan, I know you want, you have some comments to make. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I just want to put it out there um, so that 
that I have the opportunity to say it before we do the roll call vote is that um, I, I I think that I, that there's a little bit of a recency effect here that comes into play when excluding DOC and CDPS from being voting members. Um, and that's because of recent experience that basically sunsetted the CCJJ. You know, that's been at least the testimony that we received. Um, and uh, as as people and agencies that have to often, you know, execute ideas and or um, translate the idea into action, uh, I think the executive branch being excluded on a vote is something that I can't vote for. Uh, and and. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. And if if it, if the exclusion is, as Tom has said about, you know, political influence, I can look at a lot of other uh, members who are voting on that list who have the same sort of political influence that you're trying to prevent from excluding the executive branch. So uh, I just want to make sure that everybody kind of heard that for me. But I'll be voting against it if uh, DOC and CDPS and the executive branch doesn't have a vote. And I agree with Stan um, for the very same reasons. Um, as I look at this list <clears throat> and for the reasons that was given for um, TPS and DOC not to have voting, um, there's several on this list that I could call out that would have that same impact. So I'm with Stan. I, I can't vote for this um, as it stands. I, I mean, I appreciate where you're coming from. I get it. Um, but I don't think you can point to someone who can veto a bill or present and pass a bill. And, and the, the folks in ex officio can. I don't know if I'm able, if DOC is able to pass a bill because uh, they've been planning that. Yeah, I'm just going to leave that. So. Thanks for uh, letting me weigh in there, Barrett. I realize that it may not change the outcome or anything else, but I just wanted to make sure that I... Well, Stan, let me ask, should, I mean, do you think, I, I know it's not going to change your vote, but CDPS in place of the governor's policy person? Oh, I still think a governor's policy person is a good idea because it, it will codify the need for in their involvement as an ex officio member. That's fine. I don't I don't see the a problem with that at all either. Okay. Ms. Drake. I'm just trying not to take it personally that the attorney general's office is not reflected, even in, as an ex officio member. Um, and I appreciate the need to be lean and mean and streamline our little unicorn that we're building. Um, I presume that it was intentional that the attorney general's office be left off and maybe for the same reasons that you've talked about keeping the executive branch and judicial in more of a non-voting posture. And I'll just read from the chat, uh, Adrian uh, weighing in to agree with director Stancil and Hilke. Um, I also wanna be clear in what I am and am not doing here in facilitating this. Um, my intention is not to present this as this is the cake in front of you, eat it or leave. If there are members that would like to offer for discussion or proposal uh, adjustments to this list, uh, that should very much be on the table if anybody would like to offer those. And, and Vince, as we couldn't hear you very well, but I mean, if we, if we talk about a mental health professional or advocate, does that meet your need? Yes, thank you. And Madam Chair, I also want to read a comment from Emily who says this might be resolved in drafting, but I stand by my comments in earlier meetings that I think the victim survivor position needs to be someone who has lived experience interacting with the criminal legal system. Further, I think the advocate for a victim or survivor needs to have expertise in victim rights and advocate for victims through the criminal legal system, given that expertise will be essential to be able to fully participate. Ultimately, I would like to see victim rights counsel per the note that Maureen made about needing more attorney representatives. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think I support that clarification of, of who she's looking for there. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Emily. So I, I do think we're gonna to have to describe some of these yeah. uh, with a little bit more specificity. So as, as Representative Weissman. Yeah, and, and maybe maybe Ms. Tafkin and Stavall could speak to this. Um, in, in terms of calling out, you know, who who we want to bring a survivor perspective, um, there's a somewhat uh, standard site that is used uh, actually to the evidence code, uh, 1390-1071-K something, um, victim advocate in the sense of somebody who has that role with victims and uh, you know may not without consent be examined in court as to how those conversations go. Um, maybe that captures uh, what we want, maybe it doesn't, but that's something I've seen used over the years to add specificity. Thank you. And we have a, a comment from Vincent who has to jump off, but Michael is staying as his proxy, who says, what about a health public health expert who can speak to the broader population, health issues that intersect? Uh, he's having to drop off. Uh, Emily, you've got your hand up. Let me bring you in. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on Representative Weissman's comment um, that we often in statute and proposals reference uh, the community-based advocate privilege statute, that's the 107K that you referenced just now, that I, I would say that that's okay. And that's very specific to domestic violence and sexual assault advocates that doesn't really encompass victim advocates as the whole, those who are advocating for victims who are not victims of those particular crimes. The other thing that I would consider in that is that majority of community-based domestic violence and sex assault programs, um, those survivors don't report or interact or engage with the criminal legal system. And so those folks often lack some of the nuance and expertise needed to fully engage and participate in these conversations about um, transformation, what that looks like, et cetera. So I think that's what I'm at. And, and then also historically on the CCJJ, we've seen um, victims selected for the CCJJ who have never once interacted with the criminal legal system. Uh, again, kind of putting them at a loss for being able to fully participate in a way that is um, bringing that experience or expertise. So I think those are things that I would offer for consideration um, that we want to set people up for success and to be able to fully engage about what a victim's experience in the criminal legal system or with the criminal legal system actually looks like um, when we're considering victims' rights and statutory changes and transformation, all of those things. Thank you, and, and I, Mr. Reigns. I, I just, I'm trying to keep tabs of, and I'm not yes or no on any of these, but what I think I've heard is the request for consideration of additional voting members that, so, expand law enforcement to one chief and one sheriff or some rotation, a public health expert, maybe the AG, CDPS, and DOC. That's what I have, yes. And I was just gonna say that, that given the extent of some proposals here, we will not be trying to pass this or, or take a roll call vote on it. We will revise and bring it back. This will be one of our or, items of business uh, at our next meeting. Before I move us on to the juvenile entity, any other comments uh, or clarifications and requests, that, requests for the adult entity? Yeah, I believe we have captured those and, and I'll work with the chairs uh, to compare all of our notes and share those back out to make sure we've captured it all correctly. Let me move us to the juvenile entity. Um, again, with the, the adjustment for uh, Mr. Soper and Weissman to four legislators, uh, this one currently sitting uh, with two prosecutors, again, urban and rural, one public defender, again, a private criminal defense bar or ADC appointee, one guardian at litem, one person from a local child welfare entity, one child advocacy group and representative, one victim survivor, one advocate for victims and survivors, one system involved individual, one parent of a system involved individual, one research-based professional, such as brain development and child psychology, one representative from law enforcement, our ex officio members consisting of four legislators, one representative from the judicial, one representative from DYS, Division of Youth Services, and one representative from, as we've talked about it, the policy shop in the governor's office. 
Uh, Mr. Weissman, I, I'm intuiting that, that the legislative representatives carry to here. We'll hold that. Um, I, I'm going to open it up. I, I want to first check where we had comments on the first to see if those carry over for things like police, sheriffs, and, and missing entities, including AG, DOC, and CDPS. Uh, Mr. Stansel, Director Hilke, and Janet, do those recommendations carry over to this? Yes, mine do. Yes, mine does. Um, well, question, I don't know if DOC needs to be on the juvenile or DYS. DYS. Uh, I guess speaking for them. Director Stansel, do, do you see a need for, for DOC if DYS is on the juvenile entity? Well, it depends on if it's going to impact our YOS because those are all juveniles. Well, the majority of them are, well, I guess what what age them we're cutting off juveniles at. But we have young offenders in YOS as well. Understood. Let me open the full list up for full discussion. Uh, points of clarification. Uh, any concerns about who is listed or who is not listed on this membership? I'll go first. Um, so um, I see that has one garden at Lightham. I would ask that we add one council for youth. Garden at Lightham is um, an attorney that's focused on uh, the best interest of a kid, but the council for youth represents the youth's position uh, rather than um, like what's in the best interest. So as a kid goes older, grows older, they tend to have a council for youth. Um, and typically it could be the GAO that turns into the council for youth, but that's just that clarifying factor. And then, um, I, but that's it right now. Uh, Mr. Chavez, I'm gonna read your comment and then invite you in. He, he asks, uh, Noting the, the guardian ad litem and child where seeing the, the guardian ad litem and child welfare person being very similar, uh, asked if we might change one of those individuals to a CBO case manager or a local youth empowerment leader. Mr. Chavez, do you want to add additional context to that? Yeah, I I, I completely agree um, with uh, Jason's assessment, and uh, I would like um, I would either one of these folks that that I recommend added or or either the uh, welfare individual or guardian ad litem switched out for one of those. Well, here here's my issue and and you know because we have one private criminal defense bar that that would be with somebody specializing in the area of representing children in delinquency proceedings, as well as a public defender who ha specializes in representing juveniles in delinquency proceedings. Does that meet your need? Can you say it one more time? Okay, so if the, the, if the two defense lawyers, the public defender and the private defense lawyer are designated as people who represent children, in delinquency proceedings, does that meet your need? Okay, thank you. Mr. Weissman, and then I'm gonna read a, a comment from Michaela on behalf of uh, Vincent Adjady. Uh, thank you, excuse me. Um, I mean, I, I think it it's implied, it's obvious, and, and Ms. Kane just said as much, but when we get to writing things down, I mean, I just, we should be clear, we mean a one of the members of the public defender's office who uh, represents youth defendants, comparable language, in the private space. I appreciate the point about uh, Council for Youth. Uh, the legislature acted in this respect. Recently, there was a bipartisan, bicameral bill in 22, kind of updating our, our um, statutory framework on this. Council, I'll read part of the definition. Council for Youth means an attorney at law, dot, dot, dot. We're talking about uh, proceedings under articles one, three, or seven of title 19. So DNN context, um, I read this as different than the criminal defense context. Notice we didn't list Article 2.5 there for um, uh, delinquency. So I know we're trying to keep to a manageable size and I don't know what the right answer is, but I, I, I just wanna, I think, ratify the difference that 
um, there is some space between a GAL and Council for Youth, particularly as the legislature has recently updated that. Thank you, Mr. Weissman. And then uh, Michaela, again, who is proxy for Vincent, says we would highly recommend, again, a mental health advocate for the juvenile committee and would also be encouraged to see the adoption of a public health professional who can identify the health needs alongside upstream strategies for this population. As with the adult, there is no intention to go to a roll call vote on this. We've got enough substantive input uh, that we need to uh, conference. I'm sure Tom and Maureen will be spending some time together. We will also endeavor to clarify some of these points that have been raised. Are there other questions, concerns, or requests and proposals relating to the juvenile entity membership, either its size or those listed or not listed? Um, I think that um, with DYS, I really feel that their voice is necessary. And I also tend to think that they should have a vote. Uh, I think that's a little bit different than what's been said with the adults. But with with all of the intricacies that happen with juveniles, um, I think that like DYS would be able to, uh, I think they should have a vote. Thank you. And DYS is under DHS, Department of Human Services. Uh, Professor Terranova and then Ms. Drake. Um, I just have two points, uh, somewhat minor, I guess. But the system involved individual, would that be, are we, are we considering someone who's currently involved in the juvenile justice system or somebody who has been involved in the juvenile justice system but has now aged out? And I, that's a question we can consider too. Um, and, you know, I think there may be some differences between individuals who are obviously currently involved thinking of the age factor, but then also individuals who have maybe been involved in the juvenile justice system and the adult system. Um, and that may be an important differentiation. Um, and then my second comment would just be on the research-based professional. I think, you know, seeing the academic research professional on the adult entity would be an individual who would serve to bring in the empirical side of things, right? And um, what research may be saying on a litany of topics and things. The research-based professional is gonna be a little bit more specific in terms of their expertise. And so we're just not necessarily carrying over the academic or research professional fully into the juvenile entity. So again, something to consider if that's something we identify as somebody who may be more of a research professional generally in juvenile criminal justice the juvenile justice system um, and all those related uh, disciplines. Thank you, Professor. I'm gonna to go to Chair Raines. I, I will just, in response to one of your points, I will tell you when we looked at other states, uh, there were at least two states who on the system involved put a time window on that. Uh, in the case of the two that I recall seeing, it was uh, they must have been system involved within 24 months prior to their appointment to those bodies. but. Obviously, this this group can choose however you'd like to look at that. Uh, let me go to Chair Reigns and then to Ms. Drake. Yeah, I kind of like that concept of, of timing. Um, and, and to be fair, um, on the on these topics, these were difficult uh, when we had this conversation because, you know, our banter between the two of us, when I think of a system-involved youth, I can come up with, I think, just as many who have had positive experiences, outcomes, as those who have had negative and, and not succeeded or, or had bad experiences. So I, that's a tough one to thread, but, it, but it's an important role. And I, I just kind of went away from it thinking again, okay, at the task force level is where I can make sure there's balance. Ms. Drake. Thank you. I think that's a great point, Tom. Um, I just wanted to raise the question of whether the child protection ombudsman should be included. And I think that person could maybe slot into the system involved position, but that might be, I just, I don't do juvenile practice, so I'm not sure if that would be an important stakeholder to have it. Um, I think that's a good suggestion to have the CPO involved. Um, uh, someone from their office 
I think that'll I think that'll be helpful. So so what it looks like to me is that perhaps the juvenile uh may be uh two more people uh than thirteen. Uh and I don't know if that's something that the group would be okay with, but it seemed like it'll be fifteen instead of thirteen. Yeah, and, and I think we're gonna have to come back to everybody with some revised lists because I, I think we've got a, a couple of clear suggestions there. We we also had the proposals from AG or or uh, CDPS uh, on different ones of these. I do know that the ombudsman actually oversaw the task force looking at uh, prosecution age on certain juvenile uh, offenders, and uh, Ms. Villafuerte was very hands on, as was uh, Gretchen Rousseau from from DYS. So we'll have to figure that out, Tom. I I do think in the juvenile realm it's a little different in the conversation with the AG because uh, I mean you all don't do those cases. Um, from a policy perspective, I get it, but again, I, I, I don't. I, I am. I'm kind of more sold on the AG getting in on the adult side than the juvenile side, at least from my perspective. Ms. Drake, do you want to offer thoughts? Uh, I'll just respond to say that the Attorney General's office represents these different agencies as clients, and so they have some interest in a line of sight there but I'm not lobbying hard either way, just to be clear. I mean, I just really wanted to raise the fact that I find it interesting that the attorney general would be selected to be on this working group, but wouldn't have a seat at either of these entities. But um, I appreciate that we're creating a different structure. And so I'm, I'm not lobbying hard for the attorney general to have a seat necessarily, just trying to raise for everyone's consideration the you know, reasons why we might add value. Given that, and again, not speaking at all for the chairs, and then I'll call in Mr. Weissman, uh, would an ex officio seat uh, make sense for, for AG on juvenile? You know, I appreciate the question. I don't love sitting in meetings and not Thank having you. any, you know, being able to be impactful. And so I don't love that idea. Yeah. Shot I know, right? Straight. Josh, Josh, about that. Thank you. Um, you know, I was going to say, look, I appreciate the um, comment about wanting to maintain awareness. It, it tracks with a lot of what I've heard from other representatives of the AGO and years in this place. Um, I think, though, a a line here is sort of between, in terms of who is on the who gets a vote and who. Um, is EXO, or frankly, these are all open meetings. Anybody can show up or stream the Zoom or whatever. Um, there are some of us who, frankly, have pretty privileged uh, status vis-a-vis -vis the downstream legislative process. That's certainly legislators. Uh, it is the AGO. Uh, it is DOC. It is DPS. It is any part of government. Um, I think, I mean, to sum up in a broad way, a lot of what we've heard is let some more non-government voices into this conversation. Not that any of the folks up here, um, some of whom to the point about chiefs and sheriffs may be government in a different way, but they're not state government. I mean, okay, the, the academic, uh, whoever is selected, sure, could come and testify for the standard couple of minutes and take questions in committee. That's very different than being one of the rest of us. So I'm fine with legislators going back to an EXO role. I think that all of us who inhabit privilege and power around here um, should just be mindful of that. We are going to have our privilege and power later in the process, for sure. Um, to uh, Dr. Lester's point, um, you know, I appreciate the starting point of 13. Maybe the juvenile group is 15 and the adult one is 13 because that's how it needs to balance out. I think that's fine. They don't need to be the same number. Um, so clearly we're going to have to do some, Maureen, did you want to weigh in before we move on? I want to ask people's view of one representative from local government that we have on the adult side. We don't have on the juvenile because we have child welfare, local representative in that area. Um, and I just, you know, as we balance this out, that's one area that I don't think we talked about. And I know that we had testimony about that issue, which is why they were included. And we did on CCJJ have a county commissioner at various times. Um, and I wanted to just, you know, test the winds here a little bit about the whether 
we feel like that that person needs to be on, you know, the unicorn or whether that that person could be in task forces. Yeah, I, I could see two modifications. One would be a surrender by me to say on the adult, at least um, one state prosecutor and the AG to, for those two spots. And then I'm kind of getting swayed on the topic Maureen just brought up to in the law enforcement realm to say a chief and a sheriff rather than one law enforcement and one local government. That's kind of what I'm starting to think there. Mr. Weissman. Thanks. I just had a question um, maybe for the chairs. When we say, you know, one child welfare representative parents local, I mean, do we mean somebody from county human services? So that that's that's maybe not local government in quite the same way as a commissioner or or a city councilor, but um, it's very much local government in a different sense, arguably a more subject specific sense. So if that seeing nodding heads, if that is what's meant there, maybe that solves for that issue, perhaps. Um, I'll stop there for now. Yeah, and the one, but we have just local government person, which we were thinking about a county commissioner on the adult side, and and you know we heard um, the Adams County commissioner testify, keep us involved, um, and you know that particular county commissioner was very involved and he was very helpful, yeah. um, and then it's been up and down over the years, but whether or not as we try to keep the numbers down and, and listen to the voices here, how important is that slot? Or, you know, as a local, as having a county commissioner, um, because some, there are things that they will be concerned about, particularly community corrections kinds of things where the commissioners are more involved in the community corrections facility in their, in their county but not necessarily court processes, which they would not be involved in. So that that's where my brain is going, but I didn't know what other people thought. I'm gonna read one more comment. And then in about two minutes, I am gonna move us on in the interest of time. Yeah. Uh, Adrian from, from, C, from DOC, uh, question, does it make sense to include child advocacy on both entities, noting that incarcerated adults often do have children? Uh, so the implications there. Okay. Uh, Mr. Weissman, did you have a S small point? Uh, and the chairs kind of just hit on it. Um, there's the whole question of how the task forces get constituted. And let's just say we're not putting a county commissioner on the juvenile entity. It may make all the sense in the world for there to be three different county commissioners, large, medium, and small, on a task force, depending on the task force, just by way of example. So. On, on that note, uh, clearly we're going to be coming back to this. Uh, so I'm going to move us on with, with the understanding that your chairs uh, will huddle and support them a, as they make some revised proposals based on all of this input. When we get back together, I'm more inclined to do it in person so that I can lock everybody in a room and nobody leaves until we finish voting on everything. Uh, our next couple of issues are uh, going to be a, a little on the meaty side. We need to talk about where these entities sit and who's selecting and appointing folks. Uh, after this, the, the last topic is relatively short and straightforward. It's a question of the staffing and resources and support. Uh, I'd like to start with, uh, under any condition, every member has emphasized the importance of the independence and autonomy of these commissions from the oversight of anywhere that they sit, that they have that autonomy to function and that be statutorily defined. Um, we're really down to two options of does this sit under the executive someplace like cdps uh or, or dc dcj within cdps or, or pending its name change um or does it sit over under the ledge council um as i heard the conversations i really heard two things um everybody agreed that it needs to sit somewhere that could provide staff some sense that at cdps there was in place the expertise to do the type of research and support that it had historically needed with the counter argument that there were concerns about the optics uh, and the perception of it sitting under that department. Conversely, at Ledge Council, there were questions of how do we separate it 
truly from the partisanship there uh, and, and notes that ledge council has certain staffed up for different projects in the past and, and has some expertise, but that historically what they've done was slightly different from the type of staffing and expertise provided. All that to say, there's arguments for both being made from folks uh, across this working group. I'm going to open it up and start with a lightning round where I will call on people just to see your gut check of in 60 seconds, and I will cut it off at 60, where it should sit and why. Uh, and I'll start in the room to give everybody online a chance to get their thoughts together. Ms. Drake, you're right in front of me. I'll go to you first and then Ms. Kane. Great, thank you. Well, I um, really value the work that's been done by the Office of Research and Statistics, which I believe sits under the current Division of Criminal Justice. And because of those resources and the expertise that they bring, I would be in favor of having it there. Thank you. Ms. Kane. I think I want to pass right now. Thank you. Bob. <laughs> Look, I, I think there are, are um, established efficiencies and, and experience and understanding of the subject matter and, and how these things, whether we're retrofitting or recreating, you know, they've kind of seen the game. There's a, there's a fundamental understanding of what, what the expectation is. And, and I do think, I understand the perception, I under, but at, at some point we got to... Um, we got to be a little more thick skinned on this and, and, and do things where they fit best. And, and if we can change some of those perceptions by the way we've created or are creating this entity and membership, I think that's the better place to house it and, and operate from. That's just my. Representative Weissman. Uh, thank you. I just want to observe that I, I think staffing and housing um, aren't necessarily coextensive. Um, I think I, I prefer um, trying to house in the legislative branch, staffed by both. Yes, there's expertise at DPS. I want that. I don't think I've ever said otherwise. And there's expertise here. Um, it just goes to how we draft it and, and how we budget for it and, and fund people for the work that uh, we're asking them to do and support whatever branch of government they're in. Fair enough. And if I overinserted by saying home and staffed by, uh, that was not my intention to step on, on your prerogatives. And I think you're right. It, you all have the ability to structure this however you think makes sense. I would say that juvenile should be housed at the Department of Human Services. Mm -hmm. And um, the adult need to be at DCJ. Thank you. Victoria. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, DCJ is would be appropriate and kind of see wherever if we land in a different place with where this uh, entity is housed. I the inner, you know, inevitably there's going to be interaction with DCJ staff in terms of informing task force with data and things of that nature. So it seems to make the most sense to me. Thank you, Director Hilke and then Director Stansel. Yeah, Merrick, I, this is a, a a little bit of a challenge for me. I I, I just want it housed someplace where we have the horsepower to do the work. I will say though that um, it's not as clean as we might think about you know uh, one place or the other because when it was in DCJ in CDPS, um, you got the economy of scale of having a team of people while the legislation and the budget paid for just a couple of you know two and a half or whatever it paid for i don't remember i can guarantee you you got a lot more fte horsepower out of uh the division than what the budget paid for um and and so unless we want to you know be committed to to having uh enough people uh you you, you probably are going to get need to place it in an executive branch agency where you have other work that's similar uh to be able to do it that way and maybe it, maybe there is some real good logic in in uh the juvenile side being in dhs and the adult side being in dcj i'm you know i i'm indifferent to that i just want to make sure that where we house it there's a lot of dedicated staff to be able to do the work and uh and just keep in mind that 
we you got a lot more out of DCJ than you were paying for. Thank you, Director. Director Stancil, and then Ubaldo. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm I'm in the air on this one, so I don't I don't really. Yeah, I'm not really. Yeah, I'm I'm in the air on this one, so I don't have a, an opinion right now. Fair enough, Ubaldo, and then Tristan. Um, I think I agree with uh, with Dr. Lester, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say um, youth under DHS and an adult under uh, DCJ, CDPS. Tristan. I agree with Rep Weissman. And, you know, I don't think it's a matter just of optics or uh, – having a thick skin on that i think that the legislative branch is the policy making branch this is going to be a policy making body and therefore it's appropriately housed in the legislative branch not the executive thank you adrian and then uh michaela please Adrian, you're still muted on us. Tricky. I'm going to. I think I'm going to pass. Very well. Michaela. I'd say I'm deliberating, but uh, at the in this moment, more inclined toward um, LCS. Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, we don't seem to have a lot of discussion to have. So my question to you, as I see in front of me, I hear three proposals. One is to situate both over at CDPS. One proposal to situate the adult at CDPS and the juvenile at DHS. One proposal to situate both at Ledge Council. Do we want to move forward with a vote on those three? I don't think so. So we'll hold a I, I, vote. And I think people need to chew on this one a little. Very well. Before I move on to the appointing and selection process, would anybody like to offer thoughts or reflections on that, noting that we will not be taking a roll call vote on any one option, but we'll ask everybody to consider what you've heard today uh, to come back to the next conversation. Would anybody like to offer any additional thoughts? Um, and I, I have to do a little looking into Jason's proposal about whether DHS could possibly staff this or what, what research support that they would have to do this. And um, so that's why I'm glad we're holding off. <laughs> Ms. Drake. And then Mr. Weisman. I really like the concept also, but I just wonder what efficiencies we lose by splitting um, to the points that Director Hilke was making. Mr. Weisman. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Drake, I, I had a similar question. I mean, I think the point, and I appreciate it, that's a new contribution to the issue space. Um, I think the point would be tap into the subject matter knowledge there um, at the risk of bifurcation, but that's sort of what the whole coordinating council construct is for. Um, I will volunteer myself and, and figure out a way to get it done um, to track down Director Mullis and, and sort of provoke some conversations about how this might go, space, hiring, timelines, and whatnot. Um, again, I'm, I'm sort of ideating here. I'm not yet trying to speak for anybody else. We have some rough sense of you know, what's been appropriated to DCJ over years of budgets and fiscal notes. I do think we'd have to invite some conversations of the folks at DHS um, and and I'll put it on myself to um, have a conversation with LCS and try to bring some things back. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, ju I'm just gonna put in my two cents. I think with all due respect to DHS, they have a lot on their plate right now. The whole competency issue, the, the state hospital issue, the behavioral health authority, the bifurcation of agencies. So if we're just, they've got a lot. So if we're just saying DYF, DHS within the child 
that section is what we need to be thinking about because they're kind of a mess a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I want to noodle um, Rep Weissman's kind of mixing and melding of the two. I, I, I don't really care what building it takes place in. I just didn't want to lose all the kind of experience and, and benefits of DCJ. Um, so Tristan, I heard you also, and I understand where you're coming from. So our next question, and I'm first gonna open it up to, to the next question is who's appointing and, and selecting? Um, and we've got different options in front of us, uh, the executive and, and the boards and commissions or legislative. I think all of this with the big note that you all will be making some pretty, pretty specific recommendations of what goes into the statutory language defining who fills what roles. That said, when it comes to a representative of police or a representative of X or Y, somebody has to screen, select, and appoint that person. So I'll open it to the room of thoughts on one or the other for the actual appointing authority. I think it's gonna vary obviously with, with, the, with the individual membership. It's probably easier when you're talking about um, system players potentially. For instance, whether it's the public defender or prosecutors, I think it's an appointee of uh, the public defender's office or appointee of CDAC. Uh, I think you can do the same thing with the chiefs and sheriffs via their organizations. Um, obviously, I think any anything from the executive branch is going to be per the governor. I do think we want to move away from as many gubernatorial appointments as we previously had. So when we, in my mind, when you get to some of the, you know, the new membership we're contemplating, which I think will really enhance the work, that's the harder part to figure out who chooses those individuals because there are gonna be so many interested um, community groups or, or individuals that wanna fill that one or two slots. Um, so I'm open to thoughts on that, that stuff. Other thoughts from the members on who should be the appointing authority? Ms. Drake. Well, uh, Derek, I, I will sorry. say this is Stan on the appointing authority piece. Um, perhaps it needs to be a discussion about the what, what's defined in uh, case law under Title 24. Um, about should this be a type one entity or a type two entity? We heard a lot of testimony that people would love it to be independent. And we're trying to select members to create more independence, obviously, um, or at least shy away from one of the branches. Um, so is it worth us having that conversation about should it be a type one entity or type two entity? I'm going to copy and paste a little bit of text from Title 24 in here to give you an idea what that means. But, um, you know, I think it, I think you can't have that conversation without also having that conversation about the type of entity. Chairs, do you have thoughts on that before I, I switch direction and invite Ms. Drake in? Um, no. Um... I'd like the smarter people in the room to give me the difference. Yeah. Basically, Maureen, a, a type two entity is what most boards are. And it means the, you know, the entities whose statutory authority, powers, duties, and functions um, fall under the direction of the supervision of the head of the principal, de principal department. A type one gets more independent in that the, it can fall under a principal department or branch. Um, but the functions, including rulemaking, regulation, and and performing its described duties, are more independent and less under the influence of the head of the department. Um, and maybe I'm overthinking that, but when boards and commissions are, are are created, they're usually designated as a type one or a type two board. Mr. Weissman, and then Ms. Drake. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. The discussion um, for for the non sort of government structure nerds on 
Um, an example I think of um, for a type one is the Public Utilities Commission. They're actually referenced in the Constitution, like very, very empowered, important body. Um, as a purely organizational and staff support matter, they're under DORA, but um, they are governor appointed, Senate confirmed, and, and then, you know, frankly, they're, they're doing their thing. Uh, the, the head of DORA is not the boss of the PUC. So that's a type one example. Um, you know, interesting the reference to, to Title 24. Um, I mean, the old CCJJ was codified in Title 16. If we do something that is legislative in nature, it could end up in Title II. Um, I appreciate the distinction. And in this instance, um, I've actually never run this whole conversation we're having through that, that lens because I don't really think it, it needs to be either. I don't think that the old CCJ was clearly one or the other. I think we we just we codify the structure and function that we want. And I don't think that we're trying to set something up where we need to specify it is a type one agency or it is a type two agency and invoke all of the gloss that 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 means. I think we're just sort of doing, you know, whatever pink concentric circle unicorn thing we're doing. Uh, I do want to note that Director Hilke has brought, dropped the, the language from Section 241105 defining those. We'll copy and paste that and circulate it to the members because it's a little more lengthy than I can share on a screen at once. Yeah, and 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 uh, Rep. Wiseman's brain's a lot bigger than mine, and it, he very well very well may be, you know, right that we're overthinking this. But um, I go back to the testimony we heard. And to some of the conversations we've had today about membership, and I, I do think that there is a desire to have more independence. So it, that's why I bring it up. And if it doesn't need to, if we don't need to get that complicated, then uh, I think that's probably wise. So at, at the cost of me complicating it, I'm saying if we could keep it less complicated, that would be great. Understood. Janet, did you want to jump in still? I keep just skipping over you. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. I just, um, I'm thinking about efficiencies and transparency and the importance of that. And I think we probably could have some blend where if it's an agency that has a seat, they can, it would be the head of the agency or their designee, or if it's a public position a system, you know, somebody with system involvement, a survivor, somebody who's been incarcerated, et cetera. To me, it makes sense to run it through boards and commissions just because there's already an existing process to do that. And there's a way to sort of present that publicly that there's a vacancy, people know about it, or at least we have the structure there, the infrastructure to push that messaging out and to receive applications for those positions and then to make decisions. Um, so to me, just I think the structure already exists and I believe it works pretty well. Mr. Weissman, you probably have more experience. I think a lot of us have seen boards and commissions function uh, and maybe less uh, on the ledge side making appointments. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the point where, let me back up. I agree with a lot of what Mr. Rain said. I mean, when we're talking about prosecutorial appointments, CDAC should do that. When we're talking about OSPD, the public defender herself or, or whoever it is in the future should do that. Some of this sort of self-solves. I do think the harder thing is sort of people who don't fit in those boxes, I think we need a mix of executive and legislative. And then within legislative, we need to think about majority, minority, House, Senate, like we do in a bunch of things. Where we specify that something is executive, um, I mean, it probably goes through boards and commissions um, automatically, even without saying so. I think that's what the governor would do. Uh, there is not that formal of a process, um, and I can speak only really for the, the House um, Dems right now, but all manner of appointments run through the office of the Speaker by statute. Uh, and I, I can say there is a process, there is attention given to that. By way of example, if statute says the Speaker is to appoint somebody, um, I don't know, 18th Judicial District uh, Nominating Commission non-lawyer member, um, we have staff positions uh, who, among their other duties, uh, are keeping an eye out on these things. Maybe they're even talking to boards and commissions, and they'll go to members and say, hey, who fits this bill in your area? Give me some names. 
uh, and then some some screening might be done and ultimately you know, names are put in front of the speaker and, and that person has the final say. But um, there is a process, uh, if on a smaller scale than boards and commissions, because the need to make appropriate appointments is taken seriously. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to try to put words in how the Senate does it or, or the minority caucuses, but statute does give both chambers, including the minority party, appointments and and. I suspect they staff that too. So we, we, we shouldn't fear that there's not care given to that. Um, I, I do think that um, some of the appointing does need to be done legislatively. So I think maybe we, we've got some work to do between now and when we reconvene, which will be a, a short window, because just to remind everybody, uh, we're ticking down on, on under four weeks uh, to, to issue our recommendations. But it sounds like we've got some work to do on membership, and maybe in that we can tease out so, some more specific proposals on the appointing process and authority. Uh, Maureen and Tom, if that feels right to you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking here today, and that's why I passed on home, because based on my experience, DCJ had the data, the MOUs to get us data, that could give us the numbers we needed when we needed numbers, the prison population projections, the, you know, those kinds of things we could get. What did Comcore do in this? What did it do that? But what they did not have was the, the legal research capacity that LCS would have. And they didn't have the kind of the research on some of the other, you know, they, they just didn't have that staff there. And so ultimately, if the dream work to come true to staff this group up right, they would want both. And if there was some way that we could get the hybrid of that, and that's what I think Tom and I have to do a little research on if okay with you guys on how that might happen. The same things that about uh, appointing and selection authority. I think that probably we can craft it so most of them will be through appointed through their representative group, but there may need to be um, some legislative appointments um, in the mix. So um, uh, I'm taking away a lot of your ideas and seeing if we can um, merge them. Not just a unicorn, a truly magical yes. unicorn. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and Director Hilke just said that he reached out to somebody at boards and commissions about CCJJ, um, and the sources there thought it was not designated in statute, but because it was advisory, it functioned as a type two. Um, okay. So with the understanding that your chairs have some thinking and synthesizing and magical unicorn creating to do between now and when we get back together, I'm going to move us to uh, our, our final topic, and I want to be very clear, this is not a proposal. This is not something we're going to vote on. This is a brain stimulating slide um, to think about what resources and staffing are needed. Um, we have heard the number two and a half FTEs. I think Director Hilke will remind me uh, that that's what was paid for and was probably less than what was actually received. Um, we've had some conversation with the chairs about who should be involved in hiring? Are chairs of these entities involved? There was a question in particular about, do you want to designate either in statute or just in your operation that specifically half of an FTE is a data expert or other things? Um, and then as you're putting all this together and wherever this sits, they'll need to put together the fiscal note that contemplates all of the other costs associated. Um, we've talked quite a bit about the coordinating council doing community and stakeholder engagement. Uh, you'll need to think about where that fits into a fiscal note, uh, membership, and, and there's been conversations about getting these meetings out into communities. What does that mean for per diems and travel? Do you have non-staff expenses like venues and meals? Uh, and, and do you want a facilitator? And to be very clear, I don't have a dog in this race because if you choose to have a facilitator, that's going out to competitive RFP procurement. Uh, so that's not a, a self-interested question. We just wanted to put a slide so you all start thinking about for this entity to function the way you envision it, being embedded in communities and, and drawing on experts, what are the resources and staffing you believe it needs? And Director Hilke, because you've addressed it, 
I'm going to ask you to step in, in first on the type of staffing and supports uh, that were previously provided to the commission and how that felt in, in meeting their needs. This this might be where I phone a friend. I know Jack Reed is on the call and, and, uh, and, and Matt Lung. Um, with regards of staffing, they can they can solidify what we were getting in the budget versus what we were actually putting into it. Um, but I will tell you, you know, I think you asked me to opine on, asked me to opine on, you know, what it looked like is that there were periods of intense work where it took a lot more than what we had. And then sometimes, you know, th through the, through the slow times, it was enough with what we had, but you know, the, the work, Every task force and every working group and every committee has to have staffing to it, or, you know, most of it, it did it anyway. And particularly if you have two or more commissioners on any, any task force, um, it's an open meeting and any, anything that's an open meeting has, it needs to be staffed and you have to create minutes and, and on and on. And so it's, it's, <laughs> I know I've said this before and I sound like a broken record, but, um, it's a much more intensive effort than I think anybody ever realized. And for every week that we had a CCJJ meeting here, the entire week was built with meetings about every task force that we had going on, every working group that we had going on and, you know, trying to get everything lined up so that the commission had all the information and uh, making sure that we were doing the recommendations and, you know, all of that work in the minutes, et cetera. So I don't know how I can, state that any more plainly appreciate it and again I, I wasn't trying to to have this slide for people to give numbers but rather for you all who are painting the vision of how these entities should exist uh to do a little brainstorming and mr Rains. yes and i i think that's the struggle right the ebb and flow i mean it's not unlike some of the work in this building if you ask representative weissman you know how many hours a week you work on the legislature in july versus yeah. this month he's 80 hour weeks versus maybe 50 hour weeks. I don't know. Um, but, but to, we've still got to distill that down to FTE. And I, so we're going to, we're going to have to rely kind of on your department's experience to some degree. Uh, Cause I, I, I'm with you when, when the work got heavy, uh, it was in, there was a lot of it and we were, you know, we were asking for things in a 48 hour turnaround of, of significant substance um, whereas, you know, if it was August, I'm not, I'm not sure I talked to anybody over there in August. Um, but how yeah. do you think we best quantify this in terms of fiscal? Well, I think we, one of the things that we're going to have to designate is I know that staff is going to tell you how many task forces are we going to have. Yeah. Um, and, and we're going to have basically what amounts to two commissions, an adult commission and a juvenile commission. So uh, that's going to take, you know, more staff. I think it's probably wise for us to put a little bit more critical thought into it and have staff come up with some recommendations about what that is. And, and it'll be, you know, back of the napkin kind of work based on previous experience. Also, we'll have to add in, I think there's some desire to add in travel expenses and per diem and that kind of thing that, that you know, all that can be added in fairly easily. Yeah, my only, uh, you know, I know it was a lot of work at the at the commission level, but sometimes we'd have meetings and we'd have more DCJ staff people there than we had task force members there. So, I what you know, I I just want that all to be in the mix too. Um, <laughs> that wasn't uh, because they weren't invited, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, sometimes. No, we don't want to go there, Stan, about people being uninvited. But um, no, no, I'm not talking about me. But as you know, many times it was hard to get people to that were designated on task forces or even the commission. They couldn't make the meeting for one reason or another. So right, right, yeah. It's but sometimes, yeah. So we're, we'll have to think. I I do think we. I think the valid point is with two groups, with the juvenile and adult, it is going to have to be more. Yeah. So. Well, Any I, other I I'm not prepared to answer that question today, Tom. Um, no. I know Matt Lunn and Jack Reed are both on the call. 
uh, we'll circle up and try to get some numbers to you quickly. And I recognize that all of that will also happen, you know, when there's any bill drafted and the fiscal note developed. This was really just to get initial thinking on the, the scope of what it could look like uh, and for the members who have not been involved with CCJJ uh, to offer their thoughts on what types of resources you would like to see available. So that's considered uh, your chairs will work with whoever this is based on, on an actual budget. Mr. I, Reigns. I, I am going to say, um, and it's not to toss undue accolades or anything, but um, if you had asked me and Maureen uh, in December, should we have a facilitator for these groups? I would have said, no, never again. I can't endure that. Um, but after this experience, I would say yes. <laughs> and like I, and, I, I, and I, you know, I can appreciate that. I understand some of the frustration that Tom had with a facilitator. I, I, I want to be on record. I would have always advocated for a facilitator, even, even, you know, um, I, I always think that having a facilitator has been useful. Just want a third to motion, man. I totally agree that a facilitator is totally necessary. So with that, that does conclude our, our formal business for today. Uh, as I see it, we made great progress on fundamental structure, on mission. Uh, we've got some work to do revising vision. We are very close on membership. We've got a few things to sort out. Uh, and we've got some, some details to work out on where it will be housed. I would say we're sitting here at February 15th. We have exactly one month to issue a report with your recommendations. Uh, to arrive at that, we'll be ready to draft quickly, but I do think we're going to need to get this group back together in the next 10 to 14 days to address these remaining issues. I think that should give your chairs uh, the time amid their full-time jobs to pull these things together. Uh, Carrie, uh, from my team, will reach out to everybody and we'll coordinate on scheduling to find a date, time, and format that works for as many members as possible. Um, other than that, I, I think we, we're able to, to end just a little bit early. Um, as people know, I, I continue to ask for members of the public uh, who want to provide comment. Uh, I am not moving past that because I don't want to hear from them. We've made four calls for that in the chat. We have not yet had any members of the public who want to speak today. Members of the public, you continue to be able to uh, communicate with this group through the website, and we will have at least one more meeting where we conclude our voting on the remaining issues and move forward with a set of recommendations from there. Uh, that concludes the formal business, though, so I'm going to hand it over to our chairs to wrap us up and, and call it a day. We have to get a date for the next meeting. Do you want to try to do that now, or do you want Carrie and I to, to, to get with everybody offline? I, I'd rather. Let's throw a couple out and just see what kind of reaction Very well. we get. We're looking at Friday the 23rd. I can tell you my team is running a retreat for a, another agency that day. Okay. From 9 to 3. We could meet you late afternoon. Yeah, that dog don't hunt. <laughs> And, and and let me throw out, we were thinking of that we might actually need to do two more meetings, but shorter meetings. Yeah. We don't need the full four hours, so shorter meetings might um, open up time for people. Mornings, 7 to 8 in the morning. These guys. How, how, how yeah. available are you in, morning, in mornings? Uh, it depends on the morning. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't mind starting at seven thirty or could do seven thirty yeah, to nine. You and eight, I are the same. Eight but... to nine, depending <laughs> on the morning. Um, I will say, so uh, Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon is House Judiciary. Monday, Wednesday afternoon, I think is Senate Judiciary. Um, the House, at least, is going to be running long floor calendars Friday, so I'm not necessarily available even Friday afternoons going forward. Thursday. Thursday afternoon um, with. At least with lead time, I, I can continue to prioritize. Um, like maybe Thursday the 29th, I, I could actually hold the whole afternoon. We're thinking maybe Thursday the 22nd for two hours and Thursday the 29th for two hours. And we'll squeeze it in.
I'm um I, I believe that I'm booked until four or four fifteen Thursday the twenty second, but could jump in after that. Okay. So Tom says let's grab the 29th. So we'll try the 29th. We'll follow up. Bring and I will get with Tom and Maureen and get details uh, put together and out to everybody. That'll be out. I get it. Maybe March 7th. Maybe Maybe so. Maybe send out March 7th also. Just... Is that one right there, March 7th? We've got a 3 to 4.30 subcommittee we run. We can do before or after. Terry and I will reach out and talk with the two of you tomorrow and we'll get these scheduled. Other than that, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, are we concluded? Um, I don't have anything further unless anybody has anything they need to bring to the attention of the group. I agree. Thank you again. Really good discussion today.